race car again and it'll scare you to death. I've seen probably some of the most competitive races here that I've ever seen anywhere. Simply because of the racetrack. You, do, you don't race any one person here. You basically race this racetrack and you, and you better stay on your toes. If you don't, it'll, it'll get up and smack you in the face. The first time I came here, the first time I drove out of the pits onto the racetrack, I knew what everyone was talking about. I knew why they said it was the toughest track. The track too tough to tame. It's so narrow, the racing surface. Uh, if somebody crowds you a little, little bit, there's no place to go. You're into the wall. That's what makes Darlington so hard. In the 36 Southern 500s at Darlington, perhaps none was more exciting than last year. Kale Yarborough's power steering unit sends up a dangerous plume of smoke right in front of Bill Elliott. But awesome Bill came the lady in black. He beat the odds, rewrote the Darlington record books, and took the checkered flag in front of thousands of cheering fans. The win earned Bill the Winston Million. No one can earn a million dollars today, but three drivers can win $100,000 in the 37th Annual Southern 500. Live at Darlington International Raceway, we're inside the number four Kodak sponsor car driven by Rick Wilson, and we're set to go in the 37th Annual Southern 500. The threat of rain is causing an early start of this race. The lineup on the front row will be Tim Richmond in the Folgers Coffee Chevrolet car number 25. Outside of the front row will be Jeff Bodine in the number five Levi Garrett Chevrolet. In the second row will be Neil Bonnet in the number 12 Budweiser Chevrolet and Harry Gant driving the Skull Bandit car number 33. Row number three has the number 88 Frisco Oldsmobile driven by Buddy Baker. Alongside will be the Miller American Buick driven by Bobby Hillen Jr. In row number four, it's Terry Labonte in the number 44 Piedmont Airlines Oldsmobile alongside the Hardy Ford number 28 driven by K.O. Yarborough. In row number five, the Copenhagen Oldsmobile number 55 driven by Benny Parsons. Starting alongside in row number five, the Budweiser Chevrolet driven by Daryl Waltrip. The sixth row has Bobby Allison and Rick Wilson. In row number seven, it's Sterling Marlin and Bill Elliott. Row number eight, Ricky Rudd and Rusty Wallace. In the ninth row, Bill Parsons in 66 and Joe Rutman in 26. Row number 10, Richard Petty in number 43 and Morgan Shepard in 47. In the 11th row, it's Dale Earnhardt in number 3 and Jim Sauter in 75. The 12th row, Alan Kowicki in car 35 and Kyle Petty in number 7. The 13th row, number 71, Dave Marcus and 98, Ron Bouchard. Row number 14, Mike Waltrip in number 23, and Eddie Bierschwald in number 17. In the 15th row, it's Chet Phillip in 81, and Tony Allison in 54. The 16th row consists of D.K. Ulrich in number 6, and Ken Schrader in 90. Row number 17 is J.D. McDuffie and Tony Saylor. The 18th row, H.B. Bailey and Jimmy Mee. Row number 19, Buddy Arrington and Jonathan Edwards. And in row number 20, Mark Stahl and James Hilton. I'm Bob Jenkins in the booth. Jack Root in the pit area. Jerry Punch and Dick Bergeron as we get set for coverage of the 37th Annual Southern 500. The weather has not been kind to us all weekend here. Yesterday, we had uh, the American, the uh, Grand National race, rather, postponed because of rain. It was raining hard at our hotel this morning, but when we got to the racetrack, it had not been raining, and it looked very, very promising. However, we have had a few sprinkles reported on pit row just in the last 10 minutes. We go inside once again, the Rick Wilson car, as he prepares for a start. We have been told that they'll go at least one more lap before we get the green. And Bob, let's take a look at the other in-car camera. That'll be driven by Rusty Wallace in the Alugard Special, number 27 from the Raymond Beetle Stable. Now, they're both wired back in the middle of this 41-car, 42-car field with one lap to go before we green flag racing. Now, one thing to remember, starting back in 21st position is Dale Earnhardt. He had a problem during his qualifying attempt. They repaired the car, brought it back here at 7 o'clock the following day, but he had to qualify the second day, so he's going to have to carve his way to the front. Quick comment before the start of the race from Dick Bergeron. 
Well, Bob, most everybody is working on a chassis setup and an engine combination that's untested. There was no practice yesterday. They had all counted on it. Even the pole sitter's got a chassis setup and an engine combination he hasn't tried. So when this green flag drops, nobody really knows what these cars are going to do when they go into the first corner. The number 92 car driven by Jonathan Edwards has still not started. And there is some question as to whether he will be able to join the field for the start of this event. The light on top of the pace car is out, indicating that this time around we should get the green flag and begin the Southern 500. 367 laps of racing on this 1.366 mile oval. Here comes the field off of corner number four. And the green flag is out. The Southern 500 underway from Darlington, South Carolina. We're glad you could be with us on this Sunday afternoon. It's a very narrow racetrack. Tim Richmond has grabbed the lead. Neil Bonnet second. Jeff Bodine is third. But Bodine moves alongside Neil Bonnet. At the end of the back stretch, and Bodine puts himself in second place. Bodine second. Neil Bonnet is third. They come off of corner number four and complete lap number one. to straighten out the bodywork and get Richard back into this event. 
the Southern 500. Live coverage of the Southern 500 is being brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Quaker State, the big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. We are under yellow on lap number seven here at Darlington because of an accident on the main straightaway involving Richard Petty. The leader of the race is Tim Richmond, Jeff Bodine, second, Buddy Baker is third, the number 12 car of Neil Bonnet is fourth, and Harry Gann is fifth, and those specs on the windshield, we're afraid to report to you, is rain. Bob, rain is the biggest factor here all weekend. It seems to have reared its ugly head, and it's so unusual, because Labor Day here at Darlington, especially in the PD area of South Carolina, is usually filled with a lot of sunshine. Now, the guys that have a lot of work ahead of them are right there. Richard Petty's crew tried to bend away all that sheet metal. And there's a mechanic's nightmare, if there's ever been one. The STP Pontiac with damage in the front end and at the rear end of the car, but they'll work here in the next few minutes and get all the body work away from the wheels. And undoubtedly, Richard Petty will be able to get back into this competition. You know, one of the things we talked about, what a difference a year makes. Last year, at this race, we were looking at a historic possibility that came to full fruition at the end in Victory Lane when Bill Elliott captured the Winston Million and became the first driver in American history to ever win a $1 million bonus. Well, the million dollars is up for grabs today as we continue to see Tim Richmond leading the pack here under caution. But there are three drivers that do have a shot at $100,000, a consolation prize of sorts. The winner of the Daytona 500, of course, that was Jeff Bodin who was running in the second spot. Then, the winner of the Winston 500, Bobby Allison, and the winner of the World 600, of course, Dale Earnhardt. Should they be able to score a double? Win here in the Southern 500. One of those three drivers, they'll receive a $100,000 bonus from the Winston people at R.J. Reynolds. So the field is slowed under caution. Now, Tim Richmond, the leader of the race, is way out ahead of everybody else, including Jeff Bodine, who's running second. The pace car has pulled ahead of Tim Richmond on the racetrack, but I'm not real sure whether Tim just got out to a, a real big lead or whether Jeff Bodine is sort of holding up everybody else's proceedings. Well, Bob, what Tim Richmond is doing is actually he's taking care of taking care of business the way he's supposed to. He's right behind the pace car, the safety car. So it's really Bodine, in my estimation, that hasn't caught up with the rest of the field yet. We'll try to talk to Bobby Allison here on our in-car radio. Bobby Allison, this is Bob Jenkins up in the ESPN booth. Uh, do you read us? Yeah, Bob, I hear you. Bobby, uh, Richard Petty in a bit of a slide down the main straightaway into the wall here in the early going. Is the racetrack pretty green? Well, the track's a little green, but unfortunately, uh, Bob, it began to rain uh, lightly at the end of the back straightaway and into turn three. And the caution period, I think, is We'll be talking with you throughout the race. Good luck to you. Yellow light still uh, on on top of the pace car. Uh, Jerry Punch, our other pit reporter for the activity here this afternoon. Here's Jerry with Richard Petty. Richard has climbed out of the STP Pontiac. Richard, first of all, are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. What happened out there? Uh, <laughs> anytime you get close to racing with Earnhardt, you're in trouble. And I, I wasn't smart enough to get out as well. Well, Richard Petty's STP Pontiac mangle. He climbs out of it, makes a short exit of the day's Southern 500. We have a bit of an explanation as to what is going on on the racetrack. Apparently, the drivers were given the signal that we would be going green, but uh, there was a bit of an in-car protest from most of the drivers saying, it isn't safe to go green. We're going to hold up the proceedings here and not uh, get up to racing speed. So the rain is falling, or at least sprinkles, and causing us to remain under caution here at Darlington. So 11 laps have been completed. There are the red flag has just come out, and the race will be halted because of the rain. And you can see it on the uh, front windshield there of our in-car camera, and you can also see it falling. It's unbelievable, Jack. Yesterday, 
it seemed to rain just when we were beginning to do something and it's doing the same thing today. It started to sprinkle just as the command to start engine was given. Now we've run 18, make that 13 laps and the rain is beginning to fall hard enough to put an end to this event, at least temporarily. Let's try to talk to Benny Parsons. Let's get his feelings about the red flag condition. Benny Parsons, nobody likes to see a red flag, least of all you, right? You're, you're ready emotionally, mechanically, the car is sound. We want to go racing, but right now, Jack, it just fell away. What are your concerns when you park your car down here under red flag conditions? Are there anything that you and the crew try to do to get it ready to come back to green flag racing later in the day? The only concern we would have that once the car, the engine is warm as it is right now, we shut it off, that we may have a leak once it cools off. Some type of water leak, some type of gasoline. That would happen if we, once we start the car back up, we'd not be able to continue. Well, now listen, as soon as you get out of the car, go down there to the pits and pick up your RF gear, and you can go to work and talk to some of the other drivers, all right? <laughs> hey, I'm... <laughs> yeah, this is going to have my gear, right? Good luck to you, Betty. All right, the cars are proceeding down to the area of turn one, and that's where they are being stopped behind the pace car. The uh, red flag is out because of rain. We go down to Jerry Punch, who's with Larry McReynolds, the crew chief on the Joe Rutman Quaker State Buick. Jerry? There was a concern that possibly some fluid was leaking from the car. They brought a NASCAR official up to talk to you. What was the problem, Larry? Well, we've changed motors since the last practice, and, you know, we hadn't been able to practice since all the rain, and, and I think we just had the water system just a little bit too full, and there's an overflow that goes out the back of the car, and I think it just spit out the little bit of excess water that we had in the system. But the first three laps has always seen water, and after that, everything looked good and joe says the water temperatures look good no oil, no oil coming out of the no car at all it was a, it was a, it was white looking because we run a coolant in our water system and that's the reason it looked like oil i'm we'll be okay well there's more than water coming out of the car you can see on larry's uniform here the drops are falling and we're under red flag conditions here at darlington jerry exactly how hard is the rain is it more than just sprinkles at this moment well, I'd say right now it is more than just a sprinkle. It's beginning to come down fairly steadily here in the pits. In fact, pit road is starting to get damp and show the darkening color from the moisture as most of the crews now are headed down with tarpaulins to cover the cars. It has turned into a rather brisk summer afternoon thunder shower. Yeah, when we were outside our booth just before the race began, we noticed that it was getting much cooler and the wind was shifting and we had the first indication at that time that rain could become a problem here and indeed it has. The red flag is out, stopping the Southern 500 because of rain with 14 laps complete. 500 is being rain delayed here at Darlington International Raceway. But, uh, of course, we do have racing going on at Mid-Ohio IndyCar Race. Let's go now to Larry Newber, Pancho Carter, and Gary Lee, the broadcast crew at Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course for the Escort Radar Warning 200. We will to see this race restart right now than Tim Richmond. You are flying out there. Well, the car is working real well. We made some changes prior to the start because of the weather and things. Uh, that we didn't know how, uh, how it was going to react. It, uh, we had a new engine in there that we've not tried, and we have made some chassis adjustments, and they, uh, thanks to Harry Hyde, they, they were the right, the right adjustments. Now, certainly you get all psyched up for an event like this. There's a lot of tension right before the start of the green flag. But when you get a situation like this, Timmy, where you jump out of the car after having led, what does it do to your mental state? Not really that much. Uh, it's a lot easier on your mental state to, to stop the race with a wet track and get out and be talking to you than it is to stay out there and, and it be marginal whether you should race on this surface or not, which sometimes we do have to race on a marginal surface, and it's not... It's not allowing the race car driver to go out and race and do his very best because, you know, we're not used to running on the on a wet track and we don't know how far to push it. Then if you push it too far, you crash and you're out of the race and then, you know, you look like a dummy also. But you were the dummy for even starting on a on a you know on a wet marginal surface. So I I'd much rather be here talking to you than than trying to wonder whether I should race on that race track or not. When the race does restart this afternoon, uh, will this rain affect the way the cars run on it, Tim, or will you be pretty much the same way you are? Can we expect you to blast out in the lead again? 
Well, yeah, I think that's the best place to be here on this racetrack. I don't want to abuse the car too much, but I do, I would rather keep the lead all day long. That just cuts down the percentage uh, and chances of somebody else in front of me uh, losing an engine or getting in a crash with a lap car or something like that and me having to maneuver through it. I'd rather have to, uh, manu you know, cut my chances down like that. So being in the first slot would be the, the best position I can think of to be in uh, to try to get through problems that could arise. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to try to stay out there, I'm not, but I'm not going to abuse the car if I can. Well, another fellow that wants to get up in the front position for sure is Dale Earnhardt, and he's with my colleague Jerry Punch. Well, Dale Earnhardt has climbed out of the Goodwrench uh, Wrangler Chevrolet, and Dale, first of all, we talked to Richard Petty a few minutes ago, and he said there may have been a little bumper tag out there. Tell us about uh, what happened. Well, I got on him in uh, three and four, and I got just about all the way by him. My car was pushing a little bit off the corner, and uh, well, I think we rubbed a little. It felt like we did, and I looked in the mirror just as I cleared him, and, uh, he, you know, he spun sideways. But, you know, I, I was pretty much all the way by him. It was uh, just the right rear that uh, that he hit or I hit him ever what. But, uh, you know, it's close down there, and, uh, but I passed him, all, you know, passed him through the corner. I hate it happening because, you know, he's running real strong and everything, but, uh, you know, it's just breaks the game. Dale, interesting story this week. Your car was nearly destroyed or in a qualifying accident, and the guys back in the shop really worked awfully hard to put the thing back together. Tell us about the effort they put in. Well, they do a super job. You know, the car was working real well in practice, and I went down there and overdrove it or something, lost it in the qualifying. is totally my mistake, and, uh, you know, tore the car up, so they took it back home that night and, and repaired the car, and it came back, and uh, the next day ran just as good as it did the, the first day, and I qualified real well, and... You know, we had to start 21st, but still the speed was good, and the car's working good right now. It's a little tight right now, but the guys do a super job with it. I get a few adjustments and pit stops here, and we'll, we'll get going. Are you concerned about the track as far as the changing of the track with the rain now washing the rubber away and the, the car already being tight? Will that make the car a little bit tighter? Well, it may. Uh, right now, you know, it's pretty much uh, not knowing what's going to go on. The racetrack's going... Uh, if we get running again, the racetrack's going to get faster as the rubber gets laid down, so... We're uh, pretty much at the wait and see what happens. Uh, we're not really excited about not working too good right now, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get better as it goes. The racetrack comes to us. Well, you're the Western Cup point leader, and you got a chance to win $100,000 today. I know all that goes through your mind, but prom prominent in your thoughts has to be taking the win here in the Southern 500. Well, it does. You know, we got to work our way up to the front and get up front and race with the leaders and see what they've got and what we can do. And, you know, that's our, our main goal right now is just get to the front and, and, and wait until the end of the race, try to win the race. Let's go over to my colleague, Dick Bergeron, standing by with Jeff Bodine. Well, Jeff, your crew chief told us before this race started that you guys did get a chance to try your race setup. You're about the only team out here that did, and it looks good. Are you just cruising behind Timmy, or is there more stuff in that car? I was just cruising. It was still raining uh, while we are racing out there down the back straightaway, and uh, the car feels good. We're just hoping uh, it quits raining so we can get back out there and race. What does this do to your mental state? The Southern 500 is such a big deal for so many racers, and I know you were pumped up in particular wanting to win this thing. You're looking for victories this year. Well, the rain, that's part of our business. You know, we have to live with it a lot of times, and uh, we'll just wait here. We've got all afternoon. We'll wait until it dries up or quits raining, or, you know, maybe we'll have to come back tomorrow. And, uh, but we'd like to get it done today. You know, it, it was raining on the back straightaway, and, and it, was, it was okay to race during the beginning, but NASCAR didn't realize how bad it got they tried to restart the race it wasn't really raining over here on the front side where most of the officials are but we uh, drivers knew it was raining over there it was too slippery to start we saw some bad accidents yesterday because of that same situation no rain here rain over there so I chose to, uh, to lay back on that restart and show NASCAR that, that I and the rest of the fellows behind me didn't want to start the race. And I thank God they didn't start the race because it would have been a bad accident over there. They're trying to do their job and they're trying to get the race in. We want to race. So all us guys want to get this race over with. And, uh, but it just wasn't safe. This track is so narrow. It's slippery when it's dry. So a little water onto it makes it real bad. Well, hopefully the water is going to subside very shortly. This event has been going on for 37 years. It has never rained out. It's not raining any harder. We all hope it's going to get in this afternoon. But the track is getting wet because the raindrops do continue to fall. We can definitely see a much darker racetrack now than a few minutes ago because of the rain. Back in just a moment at Darlington are the order of the day, at least for the moment, as the rain continues to fall on this racetrack. Even the drivers are under their umbrellas. That's Joe Rutman taking shelter from the 
liquid sunshine that's beginning to uh, fall. Joe, one of those involved in what we call the silly season, that is trying to figure out who is going where next year as far as a car is concerned. Jack Aroot has a closer look. It's that time of the year on the NASCAR Winston Cup circuit when everybody begins to announce their changes from one team to the other. We call it the silly season, and what we've done today is, with a lot of research, have tried to put together who's doing what to whom and where they're going in 1987. Now, of course, you've heard about Darrell Waltrip, the three-time Winston Cup champion, on the verge of scoring his fourth. He's unhappy with Junior Johnson. He doesn't want to ride for Junior anymore. He says he's going to form a team with Rick Hendrick. And we know who his sponsor's going to be, don't we? All right, now, who's going to drive for Junior Johnson's team? Well, how about Terry Labonte? Get rid of him from Piedmont Airlines. Terry, good luck with Junior. Now, who's going to take care of the 44 car? Well, there's been some talk about the likes of all these drivers here. Ron Bouchard, Morgan Shepard, Joe Rutman, Red Baron, Kenny Schrader. Well, maybe Kenny's going to go up to the 44. We're not sure about that. Now, what about the 75 car? They haven't had a driver all year. And what about Neil Bonnet? You know, he's got Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, maybe Kentucky Fried Chicken's going to go here. Maybe Neil Bonnet's going to go there. And what about number 12? It's history. All right, the number 28 car, Kale Yarbrough's already announced that he's going to be leaving the team in 1987 to form his own team. So, Kale's going to go, where else, but to number 47. Sorry about it, Morgan, you're not there anymore. Now, Kale says that he's got Hardee's as a sponsor. He says it's in the bag. Okay, Kale, you're in the bag. Now, oh, we've got Morgan Shepard. Now, where's Morgan Shepard going to go? Well, you've heard us all talk about Joe Rutman. Joe Rutman's history. This team, going to take Morgan Shepard. Now, I'm I'm stuck with Joe Rutman. Where's Joe Rutman going to go? Is he going to go to the 28? Is he maybe going to go over here to replace Kenny Schrader? I don't think so. I think Joe Rutman is history. Now, what about Budweiser Beer? We said they're going to stay with Terry Labonte. We've taken care of this so we can clean up. Kentucky Fried Chicken, we've taken care of. Piedmont Airlines, well, we could take a look. Nobody's sure yet. Is he going to be pizza or is he going to be airlines? I think Kenny Schrader's going there. What about Ron Bouchard? Where's he going to go? Could he go to Red Baron, serve up pizza? Nobody knows. As you can see, it's pretty crazy. Some of it's true, some of it may not be. But one thing about rumors, you've got to believe them, at least until they come true. Mikhail Yarborough will form his own team. He's just bought the Jack Beebe team. Now, who is going to 28, Jack? Well, they've let us know today that car number 28 next year will be driven by none other than Davey Allison. Allison will run for the Rookie of the Year title in 1987 at the wheel of the Harry Rainier J.T. Lundy owned number 28. They have not announced who their sponsor will be. You know, I alluded to the fact that Hardy's will stay with Cale Yarbrough, but they have announced today, in fact, with this announcement, that Davey Allison will wheel that car for Rookie of the Year. So Harry Rainier and J.T. Lundy, they intend to stay in business. They've hired Robert Yates. And another change as of today is that uh, a youngster by the name of Joey Knuckles has now assumed the duties of race day crew chief. With the departure of Waddell Wilson, young Joey will take over those chores. So that's a look at the silly season and uh, a few of the combinations that could be coming together for the 1987 Winston Cup season. The rain continues to fall at Darlington International Raceway, interrupting the Southern 500. The western portion of the United States has been hit with one of the worst droughts in history. The farmers have needed rain badly, and they're getting it today. Unfortunately, it is not so good for racing. The Southern 500 here at Darlington, South Carolina, has been stopped with 14 laps completed because of rain. Now, Richard Petty had been involved in an accident uh, just before the uh, race was stopped. What is the situation regarding Richard, and can he do some work now on that race car during this race? Bob, under NASCAR rules, he's got to sit and stare at that dimpled STP Pontiac. He cannot do a bloody thing until they drop the yellow flag again. NASCAR rules prohibit crews from working on their cars under a red flag condition. And really, it's a good rule because you don't want to give a guy an advantage to be able to repair his car without having to lose some laps just because it's raining. So, Petty, Dale Lindman, the rest of the SDP team, they've just got to sit there and look at that. The track is getting wetter by the moment as the rain continues to fall. Well, we will be here for constant updates regarding the weather throughout the uh, next few minutes. But uh, for the moment now, we're going to take you back to next weather last Saturday night at Bristol International Raceway, where the Winston Cup cars were in action in the Bush 500. We hope you enjoy this alternate programming. This is the scene just off of turn number one at the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Complex, and that tire and wheel assembly sitting there is off of Jose Lee Garza's car. We are very late in the race. You can see there's a great deal of debris 
Jose Lee Garza has been involved in a major crash, but the good news is, even though Jose Lee is still trapped in the wreckage, is that he is awake, and the initial report, almost unbelievably, is that he is alert. And that is off the cart radios, and that is just incredible news and incredibly good news. Pancho? Well, apparently made some contact with uh, Randy Lewis and got off the course. You can see the black tire marks. He went off in, hits the guardrail and also the embankment that holds the bridge up there, uh, or the ramp to the bridge. Luckily goes underneath the bridge and ends up back out on the edge of the track, and it appears that the car is either laying on its side or almost laying completely upside down. Very lucky for Jose Lee if uh, what they say is true and that he is, uh, you know, conscious uh, even though he is still trapped in the car as long as he's uh, there and uh, able to tell the, uh, the rescue workers the Horton safety team uh, how to help get him out of the car. Pancho we are now completing 82 laps you see the field rumbling down behind him this race will only go 84 looks like it will end under yellow the leader of the race is Bobby Rahal Bobby Rahal inherited that lead when Danny Sullivan who had led Bobby for about 60 laps and just wouldn't let him pass Something had something go wrong with the car. We were speculating fuel pickup. Uh, that was confirmed a little later in the pit area. Sullivan got back out onto the racetrack, but Roberto Guerrero moved up to second. And unfortunately for Roberto, this race, as we indicated, likely will end under yellow because he was moving up on uh, Bobby Rahal just as this elongated yellow was displayed. Now we will return you to the programming. Those of you watching the stock car race in Darlington, repeating once again, Jose Le Garza is conscious and out of the car. And we are about to restart the Southern 500. We have had about a two hour and 15 minute rain delay, during which it rained pretty hard. The track though is dry enough to uh, at least put the cars out there. We may run a few laps under yellow here until the uh, track dries completely, but we're just a few minutes away from high-speed competition. Now, here is the complete restart order. There are 39 cars still out there on the racetrack, and they're the top five, led by Richmond, Bodine, Baker, Bonnet, and Gant. Now, the only car out of the race, Richard Petty, he was involved in a crash here on the main straightaway, damaged the car sufficiently to take him out of contention. They've already loaded the car onto the truck, and they've left the raceway. So 39 will restart the Southern 500 we're showing you the complete restart order right now. Now, the guy that's really made the best move so far, Bob, is Dale Earnhardt. He started 21st, and there he is in 17th position. And Ken Schrader has also shown some good advancement in the early going of this event. He has moved up to 27th position after starting 32nd. 14 laps have been completed. 367 make up the Southern 500. We haven't seen any evidence of rain now for about a half hour, and hopefully the rain is over for the day. As we look to the west, we see some layered clouds, so hopefully this thing can go its distance now. Let's check in with Bobby Allison on the track conditions themselves. Bobby, this is Jack Arood and ESPN. How does the track look in that initial tour? concerns at all about the condition of pit road that's got to be a little wetter than the racetrack itself now what they will try to do each crew has his own technique Bob on how to dry pit road some of them you will use the oil dry to try and absorb the liquid other ones will actually try and use just a simple old broom to push it away. But nonetheless, as Bobby told you, they're all concerned about it, pit crews and drivers alike, and they'll use the caution that's necessary. Benny Parsons, this is Bob Jenkins up in the booth. Are you ready to go racing? Uh, Benny, come back on that. Are you ready to go? Well, we, well, having radio trouble reaching uh, Benny Parsons, but Benny will restart in ninth position. That's where he started this race. Let's check in on pit road with Dick Bergeron. Well, it's really not all that bad down here right now. Most of the crews have spent speedy dry in the areas where the cars come to a halt. It's pretty well dried up in front of most of these teams' pit areas. 
place that could potentially be a problem, at least, is the area close to the wall where they accelerate and decelerate as they're coming in and going out. That still has some puddles in it, but we haven't had any rain here for a while, and there's a little bit of air circulating. It's a warm afternoon, and a little good fortune, some of that will dry up, too. Now, there's a, there's, there's a little bit of an advantage to the fact that we've only run, well, now 17 laps under caution. A presence on pit road is not going to be required for quite some time, so the drying process there can continue. And why they are running these cars around the racetrack at the present time behind the pace car are the exhaust headers run beneath the cars, and they're down less than maybe two inches from the pavement. As that heat begins to build, it'll dissipate the remaining fluid that's on the racetrack. You heard Tim Richmond talk to us about it, and this track will be nice and bone dry and ready to go racing shortly. These laps are counting under yellow. 17 have been completed now, and the field is in turn number four, about to complete lap number 18. We're inside Rick Wilson's Kodak machine, and there is Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt three car, and he has uh, moved up nicely. And he's got a lot to gamble today. We've talked about the fact that nobody has ever, in at least the last 27 years, started any further back from 10th with the exception of Bobby Allison and gone on to win. He's at the head of the points chase. He wants to stay out front of Darrell Waltrip. Waltrip's on one of his patented late season charges. Earnhardt ran so good in the beginning of the season, and he likes the Darlington Raceway. He's also up for grabs for a $100,000 bonus this afternoon. So there's a lot of pressure on him, and it was added pressure the fact that they had to rebuild that race car after attempting qualifying on Thursday. But so far, he's done really well. He's moved up four spots. Very badly damaged race car after a qualification attempt, but they rebuilt the car, and here it is. They're restarting this race in 17th position. Now we're inside Rusty Wallace's Alugard Pontiac as he maneuvers through turns one and two. Rusty has already had a problem early on before the rain delay. He was forced onto pit road and they changed four tires all the way around. Now, that's going to create a problem for Rusty in this respect. All of the advantage that he had before has gone by the board. He's going to have to start this race just like it's brand new, like they're dropping the green flag for the first time. As they come down, we complete lap number 19. And still no evidence of going green. The light atop the pace car will go out. And that will mean that the drivers will come around next time and receive the green flag. Bob, take a look at this picture here from the back of Rusty Wallace's Pontiac. You can see a little bit of the distortion by that long, sweeping rear window. They are so long that they do distort the view going out the backside. So when a driver looks in his rearview mirror, that's precisely what he sees. And as you can see, he really can't tell all that well who it is behind him. So he can't go back to his black book and say, oh, that's Earnhardt, I've got to block him this way, I've got to give him room here. He's really got to just guess. And that was the view that we saw from back that window. There's Rick Wilson, the Kodak car. He'll be carrying our other in-car camera. And you know, Rick's had kind of an up and down season, but since they landed that Kodak sponsorship, Larry McClure and company, as we get a view from the inside of his car, they're really, they've got a lot of high expectations for this team, not only for the rest of this year, but for 1987 as well. Rick restarting 13th. The racetrack appears to be drying very quickly now. We were uh, a little worried about the front stretch, but since the cars have been out there, and as Jack told you, the exhaust headers, if nothing else, put a lot of heat down on the racetrack and dissipate the uh, moisture, and the straightaway is looking very, very good. This is a 1.366 mile racetrack, and if you look at it from the air, you will discover that it is actually uh, an egg-shaped track. The turns are banked at 22 degrees, straightaway is 1,200 feet long, and the track is 80 feet wide, but there is a, only a very small portion of that 80 feet that is considered to groove the rest of the apron to the inside. As you can see, the first race was held in 1950, it was repaved in 1981, and will be repaved after this race before the spring race, the Trans South 500. There's Tim Richmond and Jeff Bodine, your one-two punch thus far in the early going, and Hendrick Motorsports is definitely on a roll. Richmond has run so well since just near the end of the, the first half of the season and all through this second half of the Winston Cup season. He's done well except on the short tracks, and as Benny Parsons talked about it last week in our tour of Bristol, that may be the one suspect area for the Hendrick Motorsports Richmond team in their assault upon the championship belt that Darrell Waltrip holds right now and has signaled his intent that he wants to hold it again in 1986. We will only know at the end of the season who's going to capture that Winston Cup. We continue to rack up laps under the yellow. 21 now completed. We anticipate green shortly. We'll be right back for that.
Jackson, and we are told that they'll go back to green in two more laps. There's Harold Kinder, the NASCAR flagman, holding up two fingers, two more laps, and green flag conditions will prevail here at the Southern 500 for the first time in about two hours and 30 minutes, and Rusty Wallace, carrying one of our in-car cameras, comes into the pits once again. Let's see what they're going to do to Rusty Wallace's car. It looks like maybe they're just going to top off the gas tank. They're looking at the tires on the right side. One crew member was changing the windshield. That's indeed all they did was add a little fuel. Now, Rusty is on the lead lap. Only one car of the 39 restarting is not on the lead lap, and that is the number 92 machine of Jonathan Edwards, who had trouble getting started initially back around the 1 o'clock hour and was lapped in the early going. 38 cars on the lead lap. Rusty Wallace pulling back out onto the racetrack. Now take a look at how Rusty Wallace tries to get back in the line. He's made a pit stop so he can't go to the front, and it's a down finger restart, so he's relegated right to shotgun on the field at the tail end. But he's caught up with the tail end of the field, and now he wants to keep the revs up and get ready. Remember, you can get a good look at just how bumpy a ride you can get in one of these stiffly suspended cars as you tour this old lady in the black. All right, there is Tim Richmond, followed by Jeff Bodine, Buddy Baker, and Neil Bonnet. Your first four positions. In fifth is Gant, sixth Labonte, seventh is Bobby Hillen Jr. They're on the back stretch and will go green when they come down and cross the start finish line. And we will have completed 25 laps at that point. Richmond gets to call the shots from here. He gets to see the flag first. He'll determine the speed as they come down to take the restart. Pace car is pulling off of the racetrack. Here comes the field off the fourth corner. Looking for speed for the first time in a long time, it seems. There's the green flag racing conditions once again at the Southern 500. They go three abreast. Coming down the main straightaway as some of the faster cars go low and pass the slower cars. And one of them was Dale Earnhardt. He picked up three spots on that restart. A good move by Earnhardt. Tim Richmond leads them down the back stretch once again, pulling out to about a five or six car length advantage on his teammate, Jeff Bodine. This is how they started the race with Richmond in the full position and Bodine to the outside. appears to be in good shape as the leaders are able to move up to some high speeds here. Jeff Bodine moves in on the leader. The track is in excellent shape, and you can see it just it's indicative of the way Jim Richmond and Jeff Bodine are beginning to pull away. They're running right out on the ragged edge in that real high-speed group. Bodine looks to the inside across the stripe, but he's not going to make a move at all. It looks as if Jeff Bodine they want the lead. This is what happened on the restart. Going to the inside of Bill Elliott. He loses it just a little bit. Earnhardt gets into Elliott. Elliott gathers it back in. They come across the stripe. That's part of racing the Darlington. Nice job of driving by both Bill Elliott and Dale Earnhardt, saving their cars. It looks like uh, they may have lost control and crashed, but both gathered it in. Now the Henry car is beginning to move away from the rest of the field as Buddy Baker runs in third position, but he is already about a half a straightaway behind the number five Levi Garrett Chevrolet driven by Jeff Bodine. 29 laps completed this time around. is in 15th, so Earnhardt in 16th position and looking to move up. There's a good look at Earnhardt's sandwich. He looks to the inside of Rick Wilson. He's going to try and make the pass. He comes up alongside, thinks a little bit better of it as they head into the corner and backs off. Rick Wilson looking a little bit swirly there in the third turn as more 
Morgan Shepard is moving up nicely. He went to the inside of Joe Rutman and picked up a spot. Now Earnhardt looking once again to the inside of Rick Wilson, but has to back off. Typical sparring match, and you can see the hands being sawed back and forth by Dale Earnhardt. He's really working that car, trying to look for a slight advantage to get around because he looks in his rearview mirror and he sees Morgan Shepard, one tough customer himself. Just some excellent pictures from that Kodak Oldsmobile. Now Earnhardt once again cannot get it done. You have got to be careful where you pick your place to pass here at Darlington Raceway. You just can't stick your nose out at, let's say, like a place like Talladega or Michigan. You've got to just pick it, stab it, and go for it. That's why, as you see in the picture here, the cars seem to come up real close, then back off. Now Earnhardt goes to the inside. He's going to try it one more time, coming out of the corner. He's going to do it this time, and Morgan Shepard comes right behind him. A crash in turn two is Chet Phillips. Phillip hitting the wall in corner number two and scattering a lot of debris. Everybody scrambles to miss him. They do. Phillip's car still under power. He pulls it to the apron of the racetrack and gets headed in the right direction once again. But debris on the track will cause our first caution of the day. And one would think that all of the leaders will come into the pits during this caution, be able to top off for fuel, get some input as to what the track conditions are now, and you can see the damage that's been done to Chet Phillips' circle bar truck corral car. It's pretty well dinged in the front, and they're pitting on the back stretch, so he had a very short trip to his pit area. Chet was one of only two drivers that participated in the rookie program. Rookies are required to undergo a program take some lessons from the more experienced drivers. Chet Phillip and Jonathan Edwards were the only two to participate in that. They are starting their first Darlington uh, event here this afternoon. And Harry Gant heads into the pits in number 33. Gant locks it up, trying to find his pits there, just sliding through. And there was a good indication of what Bobby Allison told us. Everybody was going to take it easy. Neil Bonnet also in, taking on right side tires. They've dropped the jack. Now, let's see if they're going to go for four tires. Yes, they do. Now, you see that move? The jack man went around, got in position, and Tim Brewer, who's changing that front tire, waited for the jack man to go around him before he went and attacked that front tire. Also, a couple of other cars on pit road as we watch Neil Bonnet pull out. Sterling Marlin and Joe Rutman both on pit road with their foot up. There is Harry Gant with his hood up. And that does not look good for Harry Gant. You don't want to go beneath the hood this early in a race. Gant had very high hopes of doing well in this race. He qualified fourth fastest, but it looks as if he has a problem with that car. We'll be right back at Darlington International Raceway where the yellow remains out because of the crash involving Chet Phillip over in car number two, and turn number two. Well, so far, some unexpected, but some expected things. We saw the pole and outside pole sitter rumble to the front here. We've had the red flag to the delay, but it looks like, you know, Richmond and Bodine are still the class of the field, at least in the early going. That is the indication, and also the indication is that we're going green once again this next time around. Here's a good look from inside Rusty Wallace's car. They start to come up through the gearbox, anticipating that restart all the way there in turns one and two. Wallace at the tail end of the pack, and he's got to be not caught asleep because he's going to try and take some positions on this restart. A couple of cars have gone behind the wall. Harry Gant and Joe Rutman are both behind the wall because of mechanical problems, and the hood is up on the Sterling Marlin machine number one in the pit area. Well, that's disappointing for the Bullseye crew. You know, they finished fourth at Talladega, and they had high hopes for here. Jeff 
Pepperdine makes a bid for that lead as they go down into the back stretch and into turn number three. He took a look and then thought better of it. And really, there's no real reason to have to go out and battle right now for the front position. He's moved right to the rear bumper of Richmond, a good indication that he's just as fast as Tim. They pulled away just a little bit from Buddy Baker in third. So what Bodine will do is just move to the inside, take a look, see what's ahead of him, and then stay right behind his teammate Tim. just a few inches as they race down the back stretch once again. But Richmond holding on to that top spot here in the early going of the Southern 500, delayed by more than two hours and 15 minutes because of rain. But the weather doesn't look too bad right now. Skies are still overcast, but it has not rained now in about an hour. And the track conditions are very conducive right now to some good, strong, high-speed racing. The dampness that was on the racetrack, most of it has disappeared. The majority of it now is down on the inside where you don't race anyway. Sure, it's 80, 80 feet wide, but there's only about 35 feet to use the racing group here. Well, let's go down to Dick Bergeron, who is with uh, apparently an early retiree from the race here again. Well, Bobby, something to not be a retiree. This was the distributor cap that was on the car. That side looked fine, but that's how Harry Gant came in. This thing was broken directly in half. And they're working on the car right beside me now trying to get the car back together again. There's about seven mechanics with their hood, hands underneath this hood, and Dan hopes to go back. Right now, Jerry Punch is up pit road, and he's with Joe Rutman. Well, Dick, we're in the garage area, and Joe Rutman is the second car to retire. Joe, what puts you out? Well, we have water running out the exhaust, which indicates that we probably got a cracked head. And, uh, you know, obviously, there's not much way to, re there's no way of repairing that, uh, that kind of a problem. It's hard to see you out of it. Let's go back up there. Terrible luck continues on the Winston Cup trail. He is the second car to drop out of competition in the Southern 500, the first being Richard Petty. On the racetrack, with 41 laps completed, it's still a battle between Tim Richmond and Jeff Bodine. I'll tell you, while we watch Tim Richmond and Jeff Bodine begin to pull away from your third place runner, there is one whale of a battle going on behind him for fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth position. Dale Yarbrough in fifth at the head of your picture, directly behind him is Bobby Hillen Jr. Then, right in the back of that package, you see him there going beneath the sign is Bill Elliott. Elliott is on the move. He set his sights now on Daryl Waltrip. He has begun to show the muscle the million dollar bill exhibited last year in his run for the million. Five cars running right together on the racetrack here. Bringing up the tail at the moment is Bill Elliott, but he has moved to ninth place after uh, starting in 14th position. But the real battle and the best one is still up front. The teammates, Richmond and Bodine, going at it. At the moment, Bodine content, it appears, to remain in second position, letting his teammate, Richmond, set the pace. When you look at the nature of these two drivers, that's exactly the way they should run. Richmond is the flamboyant one that likes to get out front and lead. Bodine, a little more calculating. He'd rather just save maybe a couple of cards in his hand later. Again, he shows just to the inside. He faints that move, but you never really see him load the cannon and try and go after it. He just peeks, sneaks a peek to the inside and then goes back behind that bolt and start. By the way, Dale Earnhardt has moved up to 12th position now from his 21st place start. Richmond and Bodine. Now Bodine once again sneaking right up on the back bumper. Number 25 car, they come down the straightaway. The lower car there to the inside is Jonathan Edwards, the number 92, but they get by him safely. Now, from the looks of things, the way Tim Richmond is running as he's here now in turns one and two, but when he gets over to turn three, it looks like possibly he has just a slight handling problem. Nothing to be real concerned about, but he'll point the nose downstairs. He'll try and get as low as possible there, and then the nose starts to run right up high up against the wall. That is usually indicative of a push with the race car. Bodine, on the other hand, seems a little more content and able to keep the car pointed down low. Each time down the main straightaway, Jeff Bodine moves his car to the left and takes a look, but has not made a real indication that he wants to pass. Now watch the line they take going into turn number three. Jeff, Tim Richmond will move right down to that low stripe, and then the car swings high. 
Well, now you used a little lap traffic there with Buddy Arrington, so you really didn't get a good look at what they call giving a car its head, letting it go to the wall, just not trying to bind it up. But that's the technique that Richmond's using now. And here's the Bill Elliott, Darrell Waltrip, and Bobby Allison battle for seventh position. Allison's in seventh, Waltrip is in eighth, and Elliott is in ninth position. And downstairs in pit road with a story from the Elliott pit is Jerry Punch. We're standing with older brother Dan Elliott and Dan Bill's starting to make his move. The car must feel pretty good to him. When Bill's starting to make his move, he said the car was just really comfortable and the engine was running good, which we didn't have any practice on him after we changed after qualifying. And he said he really liked the setup, so he said it was comfortable and we're just going to ride. You know, there was a big question mark in that engine. He said they haven't run a single lap with a brand new engine. They were concerned about how strong the engine might be. Yeah, it's really time on the engine didn't have any oil leaks or any problems with it we didn't have a chance to do that and we just had to start cold turkey so we're pretty happy right now well they're awfully confident here in the elliott pit well elliott's awfully confident right now bob he's watching a heck of a battle between bobby allison and daryl walter walter's downstairs he's looking for that seventh position Walter falling in behind Bobby Allison here, choosing not to pass at the moment. Benny Parsons has fallen back now to 10th uh, position, and there is Dale Earnhardt in 11. So 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 here running nose to tail on the racetrack. A couple of cars have to back out onto the racetrack as Waltrip makes a bid to the inside of Allison but can't pick up the spot. Both Harry Gant and Chet Phillip have come back out onto the racetrack. And there is Dale Earnhardt continuing to pick him off. He goes to the inside and passes Benny Parsons in turn four. Now compare this sparring for that seventh position between Allison and Waldron to that that we saw just moments ago between Richmond and Bodine. Bodine would faint a move to the inside. Waltrip wants the position held by, Dar by, by Bobby Allison. Watch as he takes a look to the inside. He tries to get his quarter panel up to the doorpost of Bobby Allison. That's a signal that, hey, the spot is mine. He didn't do it that time, but every other lap he's made that attempt at least going into turn three. There you can see 50 laps completed in our 28-58 update with the latest baseball scores. Of course, there was an IndyCar race this afternoon at Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. We'll have Kalein St. Day coverage of that at 8 o'clock tonight. There was an accident late in the race. What appeared to be a very serious accident involving Jose Le Garza. Larry Nuber will update us on that situation in just a few moments. There, Allison held off Darrell Waltrip one more time going into three. Waltrip tries to set him up coming out of four. He's looking for that spot, and you've got to pick your spot to make the pass. Not able to do it that time. Let's go down to Jerry Punch in the pit area once again, who's with Richard Children. Well, he's the car owner for Dale Earnhardt. Richard, are you concerned about how hard Dale's having to run the car early in the race? No, we're just, we're just going to lose a whole lot of track position. We want to try to get back to the third race for the leaders, but he's being careful right now. How is the track overall? Is the track drive pretty well? Is it going to be pretty tight with the car? Yeah, uh, we were a little tight. We're still a little bit tight. We're going to have to work with our tires on the next pit stop. How about fuel mileage? Everything going as you planned? Well, it's hard to tell until we pit. We didn't get a chance to run this in that practice. We don't know. That's the story here in the Wrangler pit. Side by side into turn one. Door handle to door handle racing and picks up the spot, forcing Bobby Allison high, and here comes Bill Elliott right behind, and Dale Earnhardt is going to try to follow also before they get to turn three. He can't get the job done, though, as the door is slammed by Bobby Allison. Now Earnhardt to the inside of Allison, and he picks up the spot. That's how quick you can go from seventh to tenth here at Darlington. A good move by Waltrip, benefiting from it was Elliott and Earnhardt. They did their homework as well. Now in seventh position is Darrell Waldrop, eighth is Allison, ninth is Earnhardt, and tenth, Bobby Allison, Benny Parsons running right behind Allison. Fifty-five laps have been completed, and the reason that we are only fifty-five laps into this race is because of a rain delay that we had. It started to rain just after the cars began, the 367 laps of it. It rained hard. They red flagged it, but we went back to racing, and now we are proceeding. We have a car smoking very badly, and a crash 
to the inside. There is the top of the car. We still can't get an indication of who it is, but the car did slide off of the racetrack and probably came into contact with that wall separating the track from the pit area. It's how quick things can change here. Just that quickly coming hurtling out of turn two. It looks like it would be Eddie Beerswale's car, number 17, and that is a tough break for Beerswale. But look at the look at the uh, the windshield. It's popped right out of its position. And they race back to the line. Here's the yellow flag display. Tim Richmond will maintain the lead and couple of cars trying to get their laps back there, but did not. That was the number 64 machine driven by Connie Saylor who tried to get ahead of Richmond, but was unable to do so before the cars crossed the line. Now, if the leaders should pit, let's watch and see what type of adjustments they make on their cars. We talked about the fact that from our perspective, it looked as if maybe Richmond was a tad tight going into this race. Let's see if one of his crew members, if he does bring the car into pit road, and he will, let's see if they make a sort of chassis adjustment look for either the front tire changer to go beneath before he pulls the wheel and puts the other one on to make an adjustment or going in the back of the area diving into the inside the cockpit to make an adjustment on what they call the four stacking bolts let's go down to our pit reporters who are going to be able to call these pit stops by the leader Jim Richmond brings the soldiers Chevrolet down to the leader and Harry Hyde and the crew will go to work under caution they should change something cold to drink they had the car on the jacks on the right side and the car number five also in the pit that's Jeff Lodine as you see both cars now in the pit they will go to the left side for Tim Richmond's left side tire change the Bolger crew now getting all four tires fresh rubber on the Chevrolet it's been leading since the green flag struck they have the car done off the jacks pretty good pit stop about 28 and a half seconds for Tim Richmond and a great credit to all these drivers because that pit road is still very slick. In fact, there are still puddles, but everybody came in and uh, didn't have a single problem. And also, you notice that they didn't make any adjustments on the car, so the way they've solved their slight problem with what we call tire stagger. They've changed it just a little bit, and hopefully that'll make the car run that much better. Richmond back out on the racetrack. Benny Parsons was the leader, but now he will come in and relinquish the lead. And so the standings are changing here as we're having our first series of pit stops in the Southern 500. 59 laps have been completed. 367 will make up this race. There was some damage showing there on the Benny Parsons car. Obviously, he's had contact with someone out there. From inside, the Kodak machine driven by Rick Wilson. We'll take where right here this location a few minutes ago was completely littered with debris from a very serious crash by Jose Lee Garza. There are the remains of Jose Lee's car. Jose Lee was trapped in the remains of that machine for about two minutes after the crash. At the middle of your screen there, you can see Jose Lee has darted off the track. You can see the skid marks. He goes through the Armco steel and into either ground that was backing the Armco or maybe the cement abutment, which is supporting that bridge that normally has pedestrian tra traffic on it as well as cars which can drive over that but the good news is as we reported to you earlier is that jose lee garza was not seriously injured and gary lee is now is now down at the hospital and can give us an update indeed with dr jay phelan and really after seeing the crash i think you have some very good news for us yes at the moment jose lee is wide awake he was unconscious only briefly he's alert doesn't appear to have any spinal injury I'd say right now, without any x-rays, the injury is limited to his right arm and his left thigh. The possibility of broken bone? Right. Now, I had heard a story that he might be flown to Cleveland first, to Mercy Hospital there. Well, we're discussing it right now, but I expect we'll fly him to uh, St. Vincent's Charity Hospital in Cleveland. Right to Cleveland? Yes. Then on to perhaps Indianapolis? Perhaps. Dr. Randolph, our orthopedic consultant, is here, and he'll be coming up to Cleveland with us and deciding whether Jose Lee should be flown on to Indianapolis. But once again, looking at the devastation, a very good report that underscores the safety of these race cars. Definitely. Okay, Larry. Thank you very much, Gary. And indeed, that is good news and our best wishes to the Garza camp also. Well, that's the story from here, Bob, where uh, Ray Hall, Sullivan, and now Roberto Guerrero are among the top challengers in this race now. I'll back to you in Darlington.
are back to racing at Darlington, and what a race we've got going. Tim Richmond and Neil Bonnet are going at it tooth and nail. As a matter of fact, Bonnet... Bodine tries the inside of Bonnet for that second position into three. Some great racing going on here now. Earnhardt looks to the inside of Bodine, trying to take away that third spot, and he does. Dale Earnhardt moves to third. Now Jeff Bodine has Terry Lapati to contend with. Lapati in that number 44 Piedmont Oldsmobile moving to the inside to crash on the main straightaway. Mike Waltrip and Bill Parsons are involved, and there may be others. Oh! Wilson just missed, and so did Benny Parsons. Boy, that was close. Boy, Woo! closer than anybody would ever want to admit to. You, you just, we talked about this track being 80 feet wide as we look at Bill Parsons get back into the gearbox and pull away from the scene of the altercation, as they would say. But once things start to break loose here out of the racing group, everybody darts and dives, but you just don't have a lot of room. Now, there's another car that was involved, Jim Sauter, pitting on the back stretch. He shows cosmetic damage to the outside, and Parsons is making his way around for service with his crew. Boy, it was just inches that this car and this man right here, Rick Wilson, missed Bill Parsons, who was in the middle of the straightaway. Let's take a look at it again. It happened coming off of corner number four, Parsons and Waltrip sideways here. Now, the racetrack is blocked. The group, look at all the cars going to the inside, up against the retaining barrier. That yellow car is, that was, wow, that was too close. Rick Wilson just threaded the needle, just a slight twitch of the wheel, and he got by. Benny Parsons also went right through the middle of everything and avoided it. And here is how it looked from Rusty Wallace's car as he scrambled to avoid. Now, try and imagine you're going to get through all this. Thread the needle. It's still about 100 miles an hour. You go by Phil Parsons. You take a look real quick as to what's happening. You try to gather it back in. And you just go, Phew. He missed it. <laughs> and so did Rick Wilson. But now the track is littered with debris, and the crew will have to, the track crew will have to come out and pick up the pieces of sheet metal and fiberglass that were torn from those race cars. We're under yellow once again with 67 laps completed. And boy, the way Tim Richmond was battling with Neil Bonnet there, Bob, one would have thought that maybe it was for the last five or six laps. Bonnet, as we said, had some real quick pit work, and he got out towards the head of the field. He took that lead on the drop of the green flag, and Tim Richmond just said, I'm going to have none of that, and just grabbed it right back away from Bonnet. A couple of cars in the pit area. Bobby Allison has come in for a, uh, a pit stop. Rick Wilson also stops, and now here comes Bill Parsons in. Here's a look as they've completed the service on the Kodak car. Now, he made it through all right, but you can see the tape. It was on the windshield there. He's got a cracked windshield. He had that before the accident, of course. We understand that Phil, that rather Jim Sauter, may have had contact with the wall up in turn number four to cause that accident here on the main straightaway. This is back under green at Darlington, and Tim Richmond has the advantage once again, followed by Neil Bonnet and Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine as they pile into turn number two once again. Now there is a Quinella right there. You've got Richmond on the point, flanked by Bonnet. Now Bodine looks to the inside of Earnhardt. He gets the spot and takes over third. But look at Earnhardt. There's nothing doing, fella. I'm going to the inside. Downstairs in three and four. Battle for third here. Earnhardt gets it back. Bodine back to fourth position. From the looks of that move, Bob, one would have to say that Earnhardt is really not using all that he's got in that race car. Just the way he took that spot back. It's almost that he's going to let the race come to him. Now, knowing the weather that has prevailed over this area all weekend, do you go for the halfway point, Jack, or do you go for the uh, full distance? I think they've said it so many times. You've got to, at least at this point in the race, go like it's going to be for the full distance. Now, you're going to run just as hard as you can here at Darlington as compared to, let's say, a Talladega or a place like that because this track is so treacherous. Drivers will tell you, you don't race the competition. You race the track itself. So whether it's 200 miles, 400 miles, or 500 miles, it doesn't matter. Every lap, you've got to race at 110%. 
Jim Richmond pulling away from the rest of the field. You can see the interval there between first and second. As Richmond has opened up about a half a straightaway advantage on second, third, fourth, and fifth. They running right together. Second, Connors. Earnhardt making a bid for second. He gets it at the end of the straightaway. Like I said, Earnhardt wants to wait for the race to come to him. He looked in his, in his front windshield and he saw that Richmond was beginning to pull away. So he just reached down and beneath the hood of that car and said, give me a little bit. Let me take over second so I can at least keep the leader in sight. He doesn't want to let Richmond get too far ahead of him. A phenomenal march for the front of the field by Dale Earnhardt, who was relegated to a second-day qualifier. He was the fastest, of course, on second-day qualification. Started this race 21st and now has moved all the way up to number two. Had he uh, been able to qualify on the first day, his speed was good enough for fifth starting position. Third, fourth, and fifth here. Bonnet and Bodine going at it. Bodine picked this spot going into turn three. He goes downstairs. Boy, Bonnet! Oh! Oh, that was close. It's almost, it looked to me like maybe Bonnet didn't see him and pinched him just a little bit downstairs. But Bodine gathered it back in. And the other guy that did a whale of a job was Terry Labonte. He gave Bodine the room to recover. Just a terrific job of driving by Jeff Bodine, whose car was almost completely sideways, and he saved it hang on to that third position. Not done intentionally. Neil Bonnet just looked down, and he just saw him, and he had to back out of it, but that's the close quarters racing that we've got here at Darlington. A great job by Bodine Bonnet, and as I said, Terry Labonte. He hung on to fourth position in that move. Now here's, what I'm, look at. here's what I'm talking about. Bodine's downstairs, Bonnet taking his customary line, gonna point the nose down into where the groove is, but Bodine is there. Bodine has to go almost down under the apron. He loses traction, and he gathers it back up. Now, see, Labonte was back out of the throttle. He gave Bodine all the room that he needed. It was a situation similar to one uh, in Bristol last weekend. You saw it on our uh, replay of that race a little bit earlier when Ricky Rudd last weekend was right behind Harry Dan when Dan got sideways, and uh, Ricky backed off the accelerator to make sure that he didn't spin. Boy, all that action is tightened up now for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth position. Bodine running up there in that uh, third spot. In fourth position now is Bonnet. Fifth goes to Labonte, and Daryl Walter has moved to sixth spot. Bodine's beginning to pull away, but the battle is for the position number four held by Neil Bonnet. Bonnet in fourth, followed by Terry Labonte, and then Daryl Walter. Waltrip on the racetrack is Bobby Hillen Jr., Neil Yarborough, Buddy Baker, who was third when we restarted this after our rain delay. In 10th position is Ricky Rudd, 11th is Bill Elliott, and the number 27 car of Rusty Wallace has moved back up to 12th position. And Tim Richmond is still maintaining a sizable lead over Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt is closing, but ever so slightly. The action is right here, what you're seeing. Labonte goes downstairs and takes the spot from Bonnet. It looks like Bonnet may have a little bit of a problem. Well, Terry made that move very, very nicely and with authority. As he moves to the low side to make the pass and then moves high on the racetrack to pass the back marker. So obviously, that Piedmont Airlines automobile is working fine. Chet Phillips is being left on the racetrack. He's been into the wall earlier in the race. Now we're going to watch the teammates go at it here. Neil Bonnet and Daryl Waltrip meet on the racetrack. And Bobby Hillen Jr. is also right there at number eight. As you watch Neil Bonnet go through the corners here, Daryl Waltrip hurtling directly behind him, it looks as if there is a little erratic movement on the part of car number 12. That would be indicative of a handling problem. Let's see if we can notice it here in turns one and two. Bonnet tries to maintain the line, and it looks like there may be just a little wiggle to the nose. Would be that that car's a tad loose. Johnson Machines running in fifth and sixth position. Neither of these drivers will be with Junior next year. Neil will be going to the Raymock operation and, of course, Daryl Waltrip with the Rick Hendrick organization. Look, look who's lurking in the back there. Cale Yarbrough, just waiting. A five-time winner of the Southern 500. He likes this race. I think the irony is he's never won the Trans South 500, but he, boy, he knows how to get it done on Labor Day weekend. 81 
laps have been completed now on the racetrack. The leader is Tim Richmond, and he is just dominating this race at the moment. Crossing the line right now in second position, the yellow car driven by Dale Earnhardt. And then back to third position is Jeff Bodine, followed by Terry Labonte in fourth, and Neil Bonnet in fifth position. So at the moment, Tim Richmond is controlling the Southern 500 at Darlington International. Tim Richmond, Dale Earnhardt, and Jeff Bodine are your top three with 85 laps completed. There's the leader, Tim Richmond, and he has about a three-second lead now on second place, Dale Earnhardt. Richmond is being very cautious as he works the race traffic because he knows there's plenty of it, and he knows that while he negotiates it, so does Dale Earnhardt. So he's not really going to lose much of his leading advantage, and he can afford, at least at this point in time, to be extra cautious. that Tim Richmond is leading and everything is going well with 87 laps completed. The bad news is it's raining and we have a car in the wall. That's number 70, J.D. McDuffie. Just a slight bump. He just kissed it. The Winkle Pontiac goes down onto the infield apron. It looks like he might have missed his pit there on the back straightaway. But so far, no yellow has been displayed because he's out of harm's way. He's out of harm's way. The car is still moving, at least for the moment, although it is now coming to a halt. But well off the racetrack and out of everybody's way so we could very easily not have a yellow flag now it is displayed the yellow comes out and it'll be a race back to the line as we were saying just before jd did kiss the wall as we watched the battle back to the line here comes tim richmond he crosses the line dale earnhardt about to right now it is raining once again over darlington international raceway not a heavy rain but Drops are beginning to show in the puddles once again, and drops are beginning to show on the windshield of Rick Wilson in the Kodak car. Now, remember what Tim Richmond told you, though. That raindrop, now, while that may obscure your visibility, because of the heat that's been built up on the racetrack, until it rains a little heavier, the racetrack is fine. It's been dried in fine fashion, and with all the heat from the tires and these cars, it dissipates as quick as it hits the pavement. Unfortunately, it doesn't do the same on the windshield. We anticipate some more pit stops in just a moment as the field will come around. Here comes Tim Richmond, here comes Dale Earnhardt, and Jeff Bodine, and others into the pit area. Let's go down to Dick Bergeron. And the pits are good. The pits are going to be a very busy place for sure. All of the ladies are into the pit area right now. This will almost certainly be a four-tire change for everyone. Richmond is gesturing wildly inside the car to his crew. He's obviously upset about something. have a problem on the speedway. More tire changes going on up and down pit road. Everybody taking on a full load of fuel. And the first car out is the 47. That's Morgan Shepard. There goes Dale Yarborough. There goes Richmond. Oh, Earnhardt and Richmond almost collide on pit road. Earnhardt, however, gets out in front of Tim Richmond. That was close, but Earnhardt won the battle. Bill Elliott has a problem, and uh, Terry Labonte's car also with a problem down here right in front of us. Looks like the car fell off the jack or the wheel fell off after they'd evicted because Labonte had begun to pull away from his pit and the car just the whole left side, the left front, just fell down to the ground. So most everybody moving out of the pit area now. Now they have Labonte's car down off the jack and moving. Bill Elliott also is back out onto the racetrack. So we are under our fifth caution period another pit stop. The car apparently fell off the jacks last time by. Dick Bergeron can explain that for us, Dick. Well, well, they definitely had a problem here in Steve Neal. The crew chief was knocked over. He was at the back of his, his uh, shirt and his pants are all skinned up. He's, he's wet. He's okay. In fact, he's the guy that's doing the work on this left front. And they did have some damage here on the left front of the automobile. But it doesn't appear to be anything major. They're putting another left front tire on the car. They beat the damage out. And Lavani is back on his way to the speedway. Unfortunately, though, he has lost the lap. So a tough break for Labonte, who is running up there in the top ten and is sixth to make that fourth position when the incident occurred. And it was just a scant few feet that cost him the lap. If they'd been able to reaffix that tire in maybe four or five seconds earlier than they did, 
stop. The stop sign was still green, saying he could have gone out. But the leaders had come across the stripe, and they had said, got to hold everybody in the pits. And Labonte lost one, one full lap. There you can see our 2858 update. The American League baseball scores will have golf later this afternoon here on ESPN. Later tonight, we will have the Escort Radar Warning 200 IndyCar race from Mid Ohio Sports Car Course. And wherever we are in our broadcast schedule, we will have the finish of this race live here on ESPN. Kind of a fitting departure for Jack Beebe, Morgan Shepard, who won in Atlanta earlier this year in April, surprised so many people with that privateer entry. He's now leading the famed Southern 500. Boy, Beebe would like nothing better than to go out as a car owner winning the oldest race in NASCAR. Second on the serial score is Jeff Bodine, then Hale Yarborough now third, Dale Earnhardt is fourth, Tim Richmond back to fifth. Sixth position is Bobby Hillis Jr., seventh is Neil Bonnet, eighth Darrell Waldrop, ninth Ricky Rudd, tenth is Buddy Baker, eleventh Bill Elliott, twelfth is Rick Wilson in thirteenth position, Dave Marcus, fourteenth is Benny Parsons, fifteenth Bobby Allen, sixteenth is the number seven car of Kyle Petty. Then we have Ron Bouchard, followed by Morgan Shepard and Rusty Wallace. Well, they've been given the signal. One lap and will be back to green flag racing. And Shepard will really have his hands full, Bob, because directly behind him is Bodine, then Yarbrough, and then Dale Earnhardt. And Earnhardt has really turned the heat up. But as I said before, I don't think sufficiently that he's wasting his race car in any way. By the way, that is Jim Sauter that is running in uh, 18th position. Morgan Shepard is the leader of the race, and he'll bring him to the green flag as we restart the Southern 500. There is the shot from Rusty Wallace's car as he moves that Pontiac down the back stretch. They are getting uh, into the two abreast restart formation. Rusty is suffering with a shock absorber problem. That's what's keeping him off the very fast pace, although he is still on the lead lap and is still running in the uh, once again and four abreast this time down the straightaway and the jockey for positions on the inside is mostly lap traffic they're looking for a spot because they're racing with those guys even though they may be two three laps down to the leaders but up front the battle is enjoyed bodine goes downstairs down the back stretch jeff bodine going to the inside of morgan shepherd and taking over the lead kale yarborough is there in the white and orange number 28 car in third position Boy, don't you think Kale Yarbrough's got mixed emotions right now? That number 47 car, he's about to purchase it. So he's going to be extra careful when he goes around that one because soon it's going to be his piece of machinery. Kale is tucked right on the back bumper of that Morgan Shepard machine, the number 47 car owned now by Jack Beebe. But it'll soon become the Kale Yarborough racing operation. Kale, a five-time winner of the Southern 500 and a five-time winner here at Darlington. First race that Cale Yarbrough ever saw was at the knee of his dad, and it was the famed Southern 500. And Cale said, from that day forward, I knew I wanted to be a race car driver. He was thrown out of the Southern 500 about four different times because he tried to race under age all in one day. His first race here at Darlington was back in 1957. Now we go back and pick up on this battle involving Tim Richmond, Dale Earnhardt, and Neil Bonnet. Richmond's in fourth, in fifth is Earnhardt, Bonnet is in sixth, and they're beginning to duke it out here as they go into turn three. Earnhardt looks at Tim Richmond's rear deck lid, stays glued right there, and look at how quick Bonnet can close up the advantage. But he seems to be lacking just a little something, not enough to stay just as tight as, as Earnhardt does to Richmond. Running in this group of cars, Behind Neil Bonnet and Bobby Dillon is Darrell Waltrip. Now we showed you part of the Bush 500 from Bristol International Speedway while we were in our rain delay. For those of you who do not know, Darrell Waltrip did go in to, go on to win that race at Bristol, followed by Terry Labonte, Jeff Bodine, Dale Earnhardt, and Harry Gann. Those were the first five finishers of the Bush 500 last Saturday night at Bristol International Raceway. And Dale Earnhardt knows that Darrell Waltrip scored that victory. Earnhardt is in the head of the points list, and he is 
being followed by Darrell Walter. Walter's done it before in 81, 82, and in 1985. He scored a Winston Cup championship after being down as many as 200 points going into this race. So Earnhardt, he feels the heat. He hears the footsteps from one Darrell Walter. Waltrip is only 121 points behind Dale Earnhardt as we enter the 21st race of the 1986 Winston Cup season. It's going down to the final race, undoubtedly, again for the Winston Cup title. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, Piedmont Airline Oldsmobile was in the pits, and Terry Labonte continues to have problems. In the last pit stop, they did not get all the lug nuts on the tires, and you heard Dick Berger talk about the problem they had. They also tagged one of their crew members, Steve Neal. He's kneeling down before that left front tire, trying to work on the car. Now they have another problem. They have lost the brakes. Apparently, when they dropped the call to Jack, they must have cut a brake line in the car. They have no brakes on it to get the car slowed. They're going to try to make some repairs and get him back out, but it could be a long afternoon for the Piedmont crew and Terry Labonte. Tough break for Terry Labonte. Labonte will be moving over to Darrell Walters Jr. Johnson prepared entry next year. But he wanted to win for Billy Hagan, and now the, the lessee of the team, Wayne King, who's taken over the day-to-day -day operation. And Steve Mill, one of the best crew chiefs in the business. Boy, he was lucky that he didn't get injured when that car fell off the jack bottom. Still up on the jack right now. They're conversing with Terry. And now the car is down. Terry Labonte moved away from the pit area and rejoined the race. Terry was the winner earlier this year at Rockingham and has had about three second place finishes. He just can't get the car to run. I thought he was going to pull behind the wall there for a moment. Indeed, that's what he wanted to do. Is he wanted to go behind the wall, but the wall was blocked by the pace car. So what they're going to do is he's going to take one quick circuit around. See Neil and the crew got set out back behind the wall. And they're going to make major repairs to the brakes. everything out of the car. But Jerry Punch right now is with someone from Terry Labonte's crew. With Steve Meal, the crew chief, and Steve, you've had a ration of problems, but what really is the problem with the car? Well, we messed up a pit stop, and it left, the car got let off the jack with a left front wheel nut on it, and Terry come back in and we fixed it, but I told him it may have hurt a brake caliper, so when he went out, he had a vibration. He thought he busted a brake rotor or might have broke a caliper or something. Actually, he had uh, equalized the left rear tire, so we fixed that, and the car's all right, but we're a bunch of laps down. You 
got hit by the car when it dropped off the deck. Are you okay? Yeah, I'll be all right. That's Steve Mill here in the Piedmont pit. Jeff Bodine continues to lead. You know, you can come to a racetrack and lay miles and miles of cable and get everything just right, but when it rains, it really causes some headaches for us. Perhaps you're not getting the best video or audio on this Sunday evening now in your uh, respective hometowns while you're watching the race. We apologize. It's simply the fact that a tremendous amount of water has fallen here and has gotten into our cables and is really messing things up. The battle is for second position, Morgan Shepard and Tim Richmond. And it's become a dandy one. Shepard holds the spot as they go to turn three, but Richmond began to make a move on him there in turns one and two. Now Richmond goes down, takes a look, backs up back into the group. Now he's trying to get a run on Morgan Shepard as they hurdle down across the start finish line. Won't do it though. This is more than a two car race. It's a four car battle for position. Shepard, Richmond right behind Dale Earnhardt and then Neil Bonnet. And Richmond's car a little bit sideways there in the second turn. We even saw some tire smoke come off of it. But Tim handled it nicely. He did drop back to about a car length and now is being challenged by Dale Earnhardt as they are at the end of the back stretch. But Richmond holds on to that third spot. Now Earnhardt again to the low side of the racetrack. He passes Tim Richmond and goes to third. Classic move by Dale Earnhardt. Saw a miscue, saw an opportunity, and just stabbed at it. Took the spot away. Morgan Shepard has been able, however, to hold on to that second position in a pretty impressive drive by Morgan, who next year goes to the Kenny Bernstein-owned team, which is now, of course, the car being driven by Joe Rutman, who retired from this race very early in the contest. So Richmond has been relegated back to the uh, fourth position. In, in fifth spot is Bonnet. Now Bonnet looked to the inside, trying to take a move, but Morgan Shepard is holding all of these guys at bay right now. And Shepard has got a little something to prove, not only for himself, but his retiring power owner, Jack Beebe. Now Bonnet looks to the inside of Richmond for the spot, and that's for fourth. Pulls alongside, at least gets about half the car alongside Tim Richmond, but then backs out of the accelerator and sets the car into third place. Terry Labonte into the pit area once again as they continue to work on that car and try to get it back in good running order. Terry Labonte was running as high as fourth position when the car fell off the jack on a pit stop and they've had trouble with it ever since. Well, you heard Steve say that they think they may have bent a brake caliper, and if that's the case, the car will vibrate terrifically, even when you're not on the brakes, because it may be rubbing up against the rotor. And boy, that's tough here. Labonte goes back into the race as we continue to watch two, three, four, and five. Now third and fourth position, it's Earnhardt and Tim Richmond. Now Neil Bonnet once again dives that car low, but is unable to pass. Here is Richmond looking to the inside of Dale Earnhardt, but he also backs out of it as they go high on the racetrack to lap number 64, Connie Saylor. Some nice early power, too, from Neil Bonnet. Bonnet has not been really that great of a ride in 1987. He's yet to be victorious. That's so unusual for any Junior Johnson ride. And Bonnet's got a lot to prove. He's going to the Raymock team next year. But it would be nice, as we talked about early on in the race, for him to be able to score a victory, gain entrance into the Winston, and possibly be able to bring to the Raymock team an invitation to the Winter Circle program that's worth about $180,000 to $200,000 in 1987. Neil Bonnet once again watches Tim Richmond's car slide just a little bit sideways in the second corner, but Bonnet thinking better of making a move. I think that Morgan Shepard has to be given a lot of credit here. He qualified in 20th position. He was the slowest qualifier on the first day of time trials at 153.3, about five miles an hour off the pole space. Pole pace, I should say. But he has held on to that second spot, and now Tim Richmond moves in at the end of the front stretch to pass Dale Earnhardt, and Richmond momentarily moves to third. Bonnet also challenging Dale Earnhardt. Now, Bonnet looked to the inside of Dale Earnhardt, but when Richmond got out of the throttle, just burped it for a second, Earnhardt had to back out. Everybody was crossed up. Not enough that you could see it on your screen, but enough that they all just played it a little cautiously because there's so much racing left. And everybody said, well, let's settle down, and we'll go for it the next lap. While all of this is going on, Jeff Bodine continues to hang on to the lead, and in fact, he continues to stretch out the advantage. There he is, lapping Jonathan Edwards in car number 92.
Pepperdine, one of three drivers here this afternoon who can win, if he should win this race, a bonus of $100,000. He yep. was the winner of the Daytona 500, and you have to win two to pick up that $100,000. Meanwhile, back for the battle in second position. Morgan Shepard runs in second. Third spot still belongs to the, the teammate of your leader, Bodine. That, of course, Richmond. Earnhardt has been moved to fourth spot. If they go down into turn one, and in fifth is Neil Bonnet. Gail Yarbrough is in sixth, and it looks as if moving into seventh, yes, it's Buddy Baker, and in eighth spot is Bill Elliott. By the way, it's a six and a half second advantage for Jeff Bodine over Morgan Shepard. There is Earnhardt, and the number 12 car of Neil Bonnet. Now behind Bonnet, at six, seventh, and eighth. Yarborough in sixth, seventh to Baker, and in eighth is Bill Elliott. And they're having one wingding battle of their own. Dale Yarborough in the Hardy's car, number 28. There is Buddy Baker, who ran as high as third, but has not been quite as fast on the racetrack since we had the rain delay. He was in the very early going of this race. He's driving the Trip Show sponsored Oldsmobile car, number 88. Bill Elliott is there in car number nine. They have to maneuver themselves through the slower traffic, going high to pass some cars and moving to the inside, in this case, to pass J.D. D.K. Ulrich in the number six car. Are you an aspiring race driver? Do you want to someday drive in Darlington? Well, study these cars. Morgan Shepard, Tim Richmond, Dale Earnhardt, Neil Bonnet, Cale Yarbrough. Watch the way they approach this racetrack and the way they work the race traffic. They go to the high side, just weave alongside a slower car. They never want to use too much energy. They don't want to force the car around. They want to just keep it as smooth as possible because that's why they call Darlington the Lady in Black. If you don't, it'll bite you. It's almost a nine-second lead now for Jeff Bodine, but look at this. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, running right together on the racetrack. This looks like almost a Talladega-type race. Well, you they're hooked into each other and uh, really going at it. Only difference is about 35 to 40 miles per hour. But the concentration, I would dare say, is higher here because of the mental fatigue that you've got to go through. In any second, you can lose a position. Baker looks to the inside of Yarbrough, and as does Elliott. Baker's hung out there. He's going to have to go for the spot. He does. He's got it. Baker moves into sixth position. Kale is back to seventh, and Bill Elliott runs in eighth spot. We have completed 122 laps of the Southern 500 at Darlington on this very overcast and what has been a very rainy weekend. The Grand National race yesterday here at Darlington, they completed three laps shy of halfway and had to stop it. And it's supposed to be finished tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock if we can get this race in. Terry Labonte comes back into the pits as we watch Earnhardt and Bonnet on the racetrack. Now Elliott and Cale Yarborough are into a tussle as Bill Elliott moves to the inside in the back stretch. And Bill Elliott moves to seventh, relegating Cale back to eighth. Again, a little jostling for positions. They're just trying to check things out. It's still a long way to go in the race, and you can be sure that the crews are keeping each of these drivers appraised as to what the weather conditions are, too. Not only on the track, but what the skies look like. And in answer to your question earlier, right now they're racing like this is going to go 500 miles. Morgan Shepard is continuing to hold on to that second place. Here is the leader, Jeff Bodine, crossing the stride, completing lap number 125. Bodine finished third last weekend at Bristol. His, win, his wins this year have come at Daytona, of course, and on the high banks of Dover Speedway. You know, Bodine had a real thrill this past week. He got a chance to go down to the United States Air Force 48th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, and they put Bodine through the paces in an F-15 Eagle Jet Fighter, and it gave him a totally new definition of speed and performance. But do you know who you know who gave him a ride in it? Mike Alexander, a Grand National driver's brother, who was a, one of the lieutenants in the Air Force, gave him a ride in that F-15. And there you had an idea of the interval between first and second. As I said, it's about a eight-second lead right now for Jeff Bodine. This 
second place uh, scramble between Morgan Shepard and Tim Richmond. Shepard pretty impressive, though, in that number 47, Race Hill Farm Buick, being able to hold off Richmond, Earnhardt, and the others and keep that second position. Morgan Shepard's a winner on the Winston Cup Tour. He won in Atlanta, and in his rookie year of Winston Cup competition, he scored a short track victory for Cliff Stewart when he drove the same number five, kind of ironic, huh, at Martinsville Speedway. So Shepard knows his way to victory lane, and he's got one heck of a crew chief, Jake Elder, who was, who was his crew chief on the 47 car today. We'll get a clocking here on exactly the interval between first and second, as Jeff Bodine now is running right behind the number 75 car of Jim Sauter, and Sauter is running in 19 spot. Here they come, and it's about a six and a half second lead for Jeff Bodine over Morgan Shepard and the others. Six and a half seconds at Darlington is not a whole lot, especially at this point in the race. We're coming up to, what, a little over 170 miles of competition. There's a lot left. This race is going to go well into the evening if we don't get any more uh, precipitation. We'll do it one more time here and see if it's a larger interval or a smaller interval for Jeff Bodine over the group of, and it's a 5.6, so almost a second shaved off there in just that one lap. Well, there's a reason for that, too. The race traffic has begun to thin out directly in front of Bodine and in front of the rest of the pack. Bodine now is kind of like blazing his way through. He's coming up on heavy race traffic, so he will have to be a little slower and a little more cautious than the rest of the field, namely Shepard and Richmond and Earnhardt. Jeff Bodine leads the Southern 500 at Darlington International Raceway. We'll be back. The Southern 500 at Darlington is being brought to you by Dodge, a performance revolution and American revolution. And by Bush Beer, the beer with a taste as smooth as its name. We're glad you could join us on this Sunday afternoon at Darlington International Raceway for the Southern 500. It's being led right now by Jeff Bodine. The story has been weather here all weekend. We had a two-hour and 13-minute rain delay. With Jeff Bodine leading, the real battle is for second position. It involves several cars, including Morgan Shepard, Tim Richmond, Dale Earnhardt, and others as they come down the straightaway and jockey for position. And a pass was made for fifth spot. Moving into fifth position was Million Dollar Bill. Bill Elliott is moving now. He's moved up to fifth, and he's beginning to challenge Dale Earnhardt for the fourth spot. He's working the race traffic, going by Eddie Beerswale. Elliott just didn't have enough time. right together on the racetrack, and Neil Bonnet is also in this battle. Let's go down to Dick Bergeron for a report from the pit area. Well, well, it may appear as if everything is just fine with Jeff Bodine's car, but the crew beside me here has been busily preparing the tires for the next pit stop. Crew chief Gary Nelson says the car, sure, it's pretty good, but it can be a little bit better. The car is a little bit loose, but they're going to change the rear tire stack, and they're going to change the handling on the car. Not that much, says Nelson, on the next pit stop. Bodine can get faster yet. Well, Jeff Bodine is having no problems at the moment keeping that lead, but look at this. It is still a tremendous race involving Bonnet, Earnhardt, and Bill Elliott. And that is the battle for the fourth spot. Elliott has taken over fourth, relegating Earnhardt back to fifth, and actually, uh, what do they say? Bonnet is in the sixth position. And look who's beginning to show in the picture as well, the 88 Crisco car of Buddy Baker. He's in the seventh position. Oh, Bonnet almost sideways there. We've seen that, though, before, and each time Neil has been able to maintain control of that car. He moves alongside Earnhardt. At the end of the straightaway, he picks up the position. What a way to capitalize on misfortune and turn it around 180 degrees and make it good fortune. That's what Neil Bonnet did. He gained a spot in the process. Yarborough, who's running behind Buddy Baker and Earnhardt and Bonnet. Now Earnhardt looking to the inside of Bonnet. All oh, the cars that appear, they touch. They bang. There's no Woo. question about it. They really put the chrome horn to each other. This is uh, reminiscent more of the Bristol Short Track last weekend in the Super Speedway at 
Lloyd Arlington, there's been a lot of body contact out there on the racetrack. Now, Let's watch, take a look at it. Watch this. Out of the throttle just a little bit. Earnhardt looks to the inside. Boom! A little bit of a drop kick. Intentional? Probably not. Just part of the racing action here. And look at Baker. Baker just had to gather it all in because he drove right up on them. It is still Jeff Bodine controlling this race and Morgan Shepard in second. There is Bodine as he continues to just run flawlessly around this 1.3-mile racetrack. With 140 laps completed, will be at the halfway point in 44 more laps. But what was going on with Gary Nelson and the Levi Garrett crew on pit road that Dick Bergman reported is indicative of their feelings about how the race is going. They're not satisfied with the way the car is. They feel that there's plenty of racing left, and boy, especially at Darlington, the setup can go away in a heartbeat. They want to be prepared to make the adjustments on the next pit stop. Now, for Jake Elder and the crew in the second place machine of Morgan Shepard, they've got to sit down and look in their playbook and say, how can we gain the advantage? But they also have to figure out what's going to happen to the racetrack. They can't try and make an advantage now for the situation. They've got to anticipate what it's going to be like maybe 30 or 40 laps from now and try and get that set up to Morgan Shepard on the next pitch stop. Tim Richmond sneaking up on Morgan Shepard and it appeared as if, as if he was going to make a run for that second spot. Now he pulls alongside once again, but drops back in line as Bill Elliott is beginning to catch now Tim Richmond for third. Looks like these guys are catching their Southern 500 stride, so to speak. They're beginning to bounce around a little bit, try each other out just a little bit more. Look at that, change of position. Second spot now goes to Tim Richmond, Morgan Shepard back to third. And Morgan Shepard had held on to that second spot for many, many laps, but finally relinquishes it to Tim Richmond. The lead, by the way, for Jeff Bodine has moved up to 7.8 seconds. While these guys have been battling for that second spot, Bodine has just continued to motor away. Now it appears as if Bill Elliott may be able to, may be ready rather, to make a move on Morgan Shepard for that third position. Bill begins to close in on the Race Hill Farms Buick and assess his chances of making the pass here. Remember Dan Elliott told us on pit road that the car was comfortable. Nobody wants to hear that about an Elliott car. If Bill says that it's comfortable, he's going to be awesome all afternoon. Bill Elliott, the winner of $1 billion here last year, but he's not eligible for that this year. While we watch our 2858 update, let's go down to the pit area once again. Well, if you've ever driven a car down the highway and sort of heard a thump, thump, thump and felt a little bump, bump and wondered what it was and felt a little anxious and a little nervous, imagine what it would be like to do it at 150 miles an hour. This is the left front wheel that they just took off Terry Labonte's car, and you can see marks on that left front wheel. Those marks were caused by the brake caliper actually contacting the wheel. That's what Labonte felt. Imagine feeling a thump, thump that you couldn't identify. You'd have several good mechanics look at it three or four times. They couldn't find it. And you're out there at 150 miles an hour, not sure where all this noise is coming from. But I'll tell you, it must have been quite a ride for Labonte. Problem's fixed now, though. So that is the explanation of Terry Labonte's problem. He has been in and out of the pits all afternoon. We continue to watch the second, third, and fourth place scramble. Up. Morgan Shepard feeling the hot breath of Bill Elliott has picked up the pace just a bit and they've closed on Tim Richmond. It's a trifecta for second spot. Now Richmond maybe has three car lengths over Shepard in third and then maybe one car length between Shepard and fourth position held by Elliott. Elliott right behind Morgan Shepard coming off of the fourth corner. But Elliott for the time being to sit right where he is and watch the action in front of him. Elliott has looked strong all race long after having started from 14 positions. He has been very competitive, and as you can see, he is now in fourth place. Now moving to the inside, they go three wide down the straightaway here. 
but Elliott still cannot pick up the position. They move to the inside and outside of Rusty Wallace to pass him, and Rusty's shock absorber problems are continuing for him in that Alugard car. He was another very optimistic race driver coming into this event, but things can go wrong, and it's been a simple matter of a shock absorber that has made Rusty Wallace as competitive this afternoon. There's Tim Richmond behind the in-car camera. Richmond, who is being posted in the second position. So that means that Wilson is one of the lap cars that Richmond has to successfully negotiate his way around. And let's see what position he takes. Boy, you can see just how loose Richmond's car was. Now, whether that was loose or tight, you can't tell from that position, but he gets by. Wilson moving to the inside of the racetrack to allow this group of cars to pass in second, third, and fourth position. Now, T.K. Ulrich also moving low on the racetrack to allow the faster cars to pass. Rick Wilson in car number four. There he is running in 14th position. He is a lap down to the leaders, but still out there and moving at uh, pretty good speed in that Oldsmobile. And, Bob, by our calculations, in about another 10 to 15 laps, we should begin to see some of the front runners presenting themselves on pit road, which, which, which could be the first green flag stop of the race. Bodine has gone by Dave Marcus to put another lap in the record books. That'll be lap 152. Now, most of them, most of them have pitted on lap 90, and it's getting tight now. Now, look at this battle for that third position. They've gotten by Richmond, and so now, oh, whoa, real close. Shepard has taken over second spot. Shepard has moved into second position, but Tim tried to take it back there at the end of the straightaway, couldn't get the job done, so it's second, third, and fourth once again, battling for the spot here at Tim Richmond, moving to the inside of Shepard once again, and taking the spot. So Richmond now back to second, or is he? Shepard. Well, this is a battle to the stripe, Bob. The caution has been displayed for Rusty Wallace there. You see it, they're going for the front position. Richmond is going to take it to the stripe. So Richmond will be second on the restart, and Morgan Shepard third. Rusty Wallace has crashed in the back stretch. Let's take a look from the other in-car camera exactly what the crash looked like. By the way, you can see Rusty is moving around in there. He's okay. But now watch here's this. how it was from the in-car camera of Rick Wilson. You're looking at it from behind Rick Wilson's car. Wallace loses it coming out of turn three. Just a slow, easy slide, and then ping! <laughs> a little puff of smoke, and he hits the retaining barrier. Rusty Wallace sits helplessly against the inside wall. He takes off the helmet, and it appears as if he's going to be calling it a day. Now here are the leader pit stops. Podine is in. They go to work on the right side of the car. And he's showing some damage. The leader's showing some damage on the right rear quarter panel. As they go to work there, Morgan Shepard, led by Jake Elder, pit crew, they're making some changes. Now, they're going to change four tires. Richmond is going to do likewise. The crew comes around. They've completed their work on the right side. They're removing the left side tires. Let's go down to Dick Bergeron, who's on pit road. Well, I'll tell you, Richmond's pit is certainly an animated place. They've changed two tires on the car. And Richmond, the whole time, was parking in his crew. Come on, guys, hurry up. It's great. He wants to get back out there and get going. So Morgan Shepard moves back out onto the racetrack. As does Bill Elliott, Morgan Shepard, Cale Yarborough, and others. Daryl Waldrop has not yet left the pit area. Now there he goes. They were jacking some weight, weren't they? Making some major chassis modifications on that car. So Jeff Bodine, I believe, is going to hold on to the lead here as he was in and out of the pits very quickly. 155 laps completed in the Southern 500. We are in our sixth caution period of the afternoon. Live coverage of our golf tournament this afternoon at 5.30. We'll break away from the Southern 500. However, we will be back with occasional updates, and we will have the finish for you live. At the moment, there are the top five. It's Bodine, Richmond, Earnhardt, Bonnet, and Elliott with 155. Out of 367 laps completed, there are the second five. Russ, Shepard, Waltrip, Baker, and Bobby Hillen Jr. There's how quick you can lose a front-running position and be relegated back to the second five. Morgan Shepard and Daryl Walter, both of them running quite well, but made long pit stops to make chassis adjustments. The pace car has positioned its light in the off position. The field is rumbling into turn three, and Bob, we're getting ready to go back to green flag racing with 156 laps in the record book. Still not to the halfway point. That will be lap 184. Rick Wilson 
is having trouble with that number four Kodak car. He was in for a very long pit stop, but now is back out there, and he himself is getting ready for the restart. Looks like the Long Island Expressway waiting to go through the toll booth there. As he begins to build the revs up, you see the tachometer go up and shift through the gear. We're back racing again. Thundering herd down the main straightaway, receiving the green flag. Benny Parsons' car is faltering here at the start. He's dropping low on the racetrack. Meanwhile, some body contact between Dave Marcus and, and Tim Richmond. There in turn number two, Richmond set sail for his teammate, the leader, Jeff Bodine. Bodine just shot himself out of a cannon. He's got a sizable advantage over Richmond. But at the far end of the screen, there's Dale Earnhardt. He's just reeling in, Tim Richmond. There's where the battle's going to be for second spot shortly. Dale Earnhardt moving up quickly on second place, Tim Richmond. The field comes out of turn number four, coming down the main straightaway once again. There's the interval between first and second position, Bodine and Richmond, and the narrowing margin between second and third as Earnhardt moves in on Tim Richmond. Benny Parsons' car just would not go on that restart. He dropped low on the racetrack and has fallen back considerably. Earnhardt and Richmond, neighbors, friends, they talk a lot about racing. They have a style that's very similar. Both of them would like to win the Southern 500, as would this gentleman, Jeff Bodine. Bodine, I think, more than anyone, is really super motivated for this win. But you can't cut out Morgan Shepard and Darrell Waltrip either. Now, they had that low pit stop. They're running back in the second ton of 10, as we say, being shown in seventh and eighth positions right now. But they've made some chassis modifications. And right now, they're trying to test it out to see if they're going to work to their advantage or not. Walter puts to the high side of Shepard and just did a whoop de doo scoop down low, but couldn't get by the top 10 just a moment ago. Also on the lead lap, Tommy Allison and Kale Yarborough. Now a lap down in 13th position unofficially is Dave Marcus. In 14th, also a lap down, Kyle Petty. And in 15th is Ron Bouchard. There is the 7th and 8th place runners, Morgan Shepard and Daryl Waltrip. A Buick and a Chevrolet. Very different body configuration. One with a long big rear window. That's the Chevrolet Monte Carlo SS of Darrell Waltrip. The other one with kind of a blunt nose, that being the Buick, that has a kind of a unique hood to it that wraps around almost down to the quarter panel. But Morgan Shepard is holding Waltrip and now Buddy Baker at bay for that battle for seventh spot. Baker all of a sudden makes himself a factor in this race for seventh spot as Baker has closed in on the rear of the Darrell Waltrip car. They move into turn number three and we now have three cars nose to tail battling for that position. You can still see evidence of the rain that we had earlier today as on the inside of the racetrack there are still some dark spots and those spots are wet. But the groove itself, the racetrack that they used to run on is completely dry. We have had no rain now in quite a while and we are still optimistic that we will continue to get this race in. Buddy Baker making the move on Darrell Waltrip and moving into eighth position. And he acquired it very nicely. Baker, a good call to him in the first half of this race. He's driven a heady race. He knows it's a long distance event. Now he's set his sights on Morgan Shepard. If they come down across the stripe, will he get him? They're side by side as they hit the stripe in that battle for the seventh spot. He's got it. Buddy Baker goes into seventh, having picked off both Waltrip and Morgan Shepard in that last lap. The number 88 car is the one that Al Unser was asked to drive at Watkins Glen while Buddy Baker played crew chief that weekend. But now Buddy is back in the car for this Southern 500 and doing a fine job. And Baker owns that car along with textile magnate Danny Schiff. And, you know, you ought to hear Baker tell the stories about being an owner and a driver. He says, what can you do? If it's an owner, you can't fire the driver. Buddy Baker has won twice here on Darlington International Raceway, but he has never been a winner of the Southern 500. Both of his victories have come in the spring race, which is now called the Grand South 500. Approaching Dave Marcus in car number 71, Marcus will move to the high side of the racetrack and allow Buddy to go low. It's evident that Baker is getting hooked up now. He's beginning to turn the wick up. He is leaving Morgan Shepard and Darrell Waltrip in his wake. He's put Dave Marcus between himself and those as he stays 
solidly in seventh spot, but he's got a long way to go before he comes up on Bill Elliott, who's posted in the fifth position. And a guy that we have uh, not talked about hardly at all today, but someone who is solidly in this race in sixth position, the driver who's in the car right ahead of Buddy Baker, and that is Ricky Rudd. Rudd driving for Bud Moore. They've renewed their contract for 1987. Rudd will stay at the wheel of the Motorcraft Ford. Now, let's see if Baker can reel in Rudd as easily as he did Shepard and Earnhardt. Not quite so easy in turn one. Let's see what he does coming out of two. Can he gain the momentum to try and pass that Ford Thunderbird? Rudd, as you said, kind of unnoticed, kind of quiet, but he's there solidly in six. And here's the battle for the front position. Jim Richmond takes it. So for the first time in many, many laps, we have a change of leader. Jeff Bodine had been dominating this race since the 96th lap. However, now Jim Richmond, the pole sitter in today's Southern 500, grabs the lead away from Jeff Bodine and Tim Richmond, now being shown as the leader on lap 167. Boy, Richmond just pulled away to a good size advantage there once he negotiated the pass of Bodine. Bodine, there you see him in second spot. Richmond looks like he may have cured some of his handling difficulties as well, Bob. It just doesn't seem to dart as much. It, it looks like the car is a little steadier in turn three and four. In the last ten races, Tim Richmond has finished either first or second in eight of them. He had a... Uh, very poor, so to speak, 15th place finish at Michigan, and he was sixth last weekend on the high banks of Bristol. Aside from that, in the last 10, 10 races, Richmond either first or second, and he obviously is uh, happy with the way that this car and his crew chief, Harry Hyde, and the rest of the team has performed. Don't count out Tim Richmond either because in the points base because he's only about 175 points, actually 165 points behind your leader, Dale Earnhardt. And Richmond has always said he wants to let his right foot do his talking as it applies to the Winston Cup Championship. But he's going to have to get his short track program better prepared than it was at Bristol if he hopes to win the Winston Cup. shot of the fourth turn of the Darlington Raceway and well within walking distance is an establishment that holds just about as much history. It's called the Raceway Grill and it's where the Winston Cup elite need to eat. It may not be the 21 Club or the Brown Derby, but it's close and the food is good. Teams can take a quick time out from their chores and duck over here to fill their stomachs and be ready to get after it some more. Believe me, more race setups have been talked over this kind of a setup than in any garage area anywhere. Hey, wait a minute, what are you doing here? The cheeseburgers are fantastic. Richmond, Bodine, Earnhardt, Bonnet, and Elliott your top five with 169 laps complete at the Southern 500. Leading the Southern 500, and Jeff Bodine, his teammate, running in second spot. Let's go to Dick Bergeron, who is with Jeff Bodine's crew chief, Gary Nelson. Well, Gary, after you guys led so many laps, Tim has blown by you. Is there a problem with the car? What's going on? Are you just being conservative at this point? Well, definitely. We're, uh, we're on the loose side. The car, can, Jeff can run the car faster than he is, but it's too early to take chances. bigger adjustment this stop and see if that'll do it. Now they've been looking at all the tire charts just to make sure they get exactly the right setup. Meanwhile, up pit road, very much one up with another competitor. Then, Benny, it's been a rough afternoon for you. We've had to park the Copenhagen Oldsmobile. What put you out? On the restart, the transmission went away, Jerry. I, I don't know what happened. 
up, and I think that I probably knocked all the teeth off the main drive in the transmission. Probably what happened. You had trouble earlier in the day. You got into a little bit of a fender duel with someone out there and had some brake problems. Yep. When uh, the 17 car wrecked on the back, I ran the back of Bobby Allison. The mix up on the front straightaway. I hit the 23 car or something. I just couldn't stop. I have a spin on the track bidding. And it is Jim Sauter in car number 75 who spins to the infield, the inside of the racetrack in turn two. It was a real lazy sort of spin. No real danger, no real harm done, no foul. But for Sauter, it's been a long afternoon in that nationwide Pontiac. You know, this is only Sauter's second race here. The last one was the, his first one in 1981, and he only ran 20 laps there. So he's paying his dues here at the Lady of Black. Morgan Shepard, the uh, driver of that car on the short tracks, Sauter here on the super speedways. We have not seen the yellow flag. And again, Sauter's car is well off of the racetrack. But now the yellow does come out. We apologize to Benny for having to bring a premature halt to that uh, conversation with him. And we know that Benny will be back uh, on the racetrack and hopefully in the broadcast booth with us here on ESPN. Bob, a lot of viewers may wonder, why doesn't the caution come out real quick? Why don't they show the flag? When you've got a car positioned like that one, where Jim Sauter was, they said, no harm, no foul. They want to wait and see if the driver will be able to refire it first. If he can, and then pull it back and drive away, we'll stay with green flag racing. When they let what seems to be a long time, but was only about 8 to 10 seconds tick off, then they say, all right, let's put it out because it must be obvious that he can't get the car refired. So the yellow has come out, and now we anticipate more pit stops. And we heard Gary Nelson say that they were going to have to make a major adjustment this time to try and find the advantage that they need to go back to run to the front. We'll have to wait and see what Nelson and company do to Jeff Bodine, who's running in second position. And also, they don't cut out Harry Hyde with Tim Richmond. It looks like Hyde Whoa. kept Richmond out there to lead a lap. Well, why would that be? All of a sudden, he just pulled back onto the racetrack, Tim Richmond did, allowing everyone else, including his teammate Bodine, Earnhardt, Bonnet, Elliott, Baker, Waltrip, Yarborough, Allison, and others to come in. Don't know. I mean, that that really is a question because he's already led enough laps. He's got, you know, he's got that to his advantage. So if he's looking for points, that wouldn't be. But the way that he was called out there, it looks to me almost as if Richmond was told on the radio, stay out, don't come in at the last minute. Well, maybe it's because he's happy with the tires that he has on the car right now, and he feels that there will be an ample opportunity to come in for fuel, so he's just happy with the car and is staying out there. Dale Earnhardt, by the way, had a very quick pit stop and is, above, is uh, the first one out of the pits from this series of stops. Now, here's a strategy move, I would think, on, on Harry Hyde's part. Fuel is not in precious commodity right now. They pitted just a while back, so they've got plenty of fuel. I think Harry Hyde may have gambled and said this way, look, the tires are good on the car, no sense coming in and topping off the fuel. If the rain comes, you've got the lead. They've all got to work their way back through the lap race traffic. But if it doesn't rain, if they do start to close in on them, the likes of Dale Earnhardt and Morgan Shepard, well, he's still got everything that he needs to be able to go the distance until his next customary pit stop. But the question mark is they'll need another caution or they'll have to do it under green. We will reach the halfway point in three more laps. And we'll be back with our coverage from Darlington after these messages. Has just come back out at Darlington, and this completes lap number 183 now. One more lap will be halfway, and if we should have a major downpour, the race would be stopped, and it would be considered a complete race. Now, Tim Richmond did not pit on that uh, most recent caution. Why, Dick Bergeron, tell us the reason. Well, I asked Harry Hyde that, Bob, and he just pointed up at the sky, and as you can see, it's very dark. You guys can't see it because it's behind you, but dark clouds are coming in. It is starting to rain again. If he stayed in the lead, and if we do get a rain, and if it rains it out, he's the winner. Never count Harry Hyde out. He is one shot of the Boy, look at this battle, too. They're racing for things now. The 47 of Morgan Shepard. Neil Bonnet running there, and 
Jeff Bodine. They've made their pit stop, and they are battling for third, fourth, and fifth spots, respectively. Bodine looking for the fourth spot. He goes to the inside of Bonnet. From the looks of things, Bob, everybody has seen the dark clouds except us because they're occluded from us, and I think they're all racing like now. This thing's only going to go about halfway. That is exactly my thoughts. It's obvious that Jeff Bodine is trying to get to the front very, very quickly. Now, Jeff Bodine to the inside of Morgan Shepard. He passes Morgan, and now Jeff Bodine is in third spot, setting sail for second place, Dale Earnhardt. We do have a complete race. We are past the halfway point. So we will not be back tomorrow. The question is, can we complete the full distance here this afternoon, or will we have to stop it prematurely? And with the foreboding clouds behind us, you're going to watch these drivers, and in their mind, they're going to drive it like there's only 50 or maybe 60 miles to go in the Southern 500. They've all turned the wick up. The lap speeds are much quicker now. They're trying to lay every card they have on the table. Nobody wants to have this one be a runaway for Tim Richmond, but maybe Harry Hyde gave Richmond the unfair advantage. Fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh here. It is Bonnet going to the inside, passing Morgan Shepard, taking fourth. Here comes Ricky Rudd into fifth, Shepard back to sixth, and that is Bill Elliott running in eighth position. They have taken seventh. they've taken the gloves off now. They are scrapping for every spot they can get. Ricky Rudd, who really we neglected so often in the early going here, was poised in position, ready to get into the hunt. He's done that right now. He's being posted there in the third spot. Right in front is Tim Richmond. In second is Dale Earnhardt. Then Rudd comes into play. Now Jeff Bodine passes Dale Earnhardt. There you can see them as they go into turn number three. Bodine has moved into second position. He is really charging toward the front, but he has that much interval right there. Richmond now Bodine. There's that much separation between first and second. Now here's where the strategy can go awry. Let's take a look at Tim Richmond as he circuits the racetrack, especially in the corners, and compare. You see the way Bodine is running there. Very nice and easy. The car has its own head. He's running quite well. Now let's look at Richmond, see if there's any kind of a squirreliness to Richmond. Is the car pointing towards the wall? Well, not too bad. Let's see if we can see because he may be using worn tires, even though they're a good set. They could go away on him, and it could cost him the spot because Bodine's closing. There is less than a second interval between first and second as Bodine continues to move in on the leader, Tim Richmond. We go back and take a look at the pass. Here is the pass for second spot. Earnhardt is up on the high side. Bodine just rides the roller coaster down out of turn two, and he's got... He's got the spot right there. Now, Bodine just gets enough. Now, is, isn't that... Whoa, look at that. Caution is out on the racetrack, and Bodine comes to the oh! right. It was close, but Richmond beat him to the line. The caution is out. Why? The report is that there is debris on the racetrack, some metal down here in one of the corners, and they're going to have to go back and, uh, try and try and pick it up. You can see from the looks of that speed shot that there has been some precipitation, but not enough for the, that to be the reason for the yellow flag. But boy, that was a close call for Tim Richmond. And there is the debris out on the racetrack. Hard to believe that that could create a problem, but you wouldn't want to run over that right there down before the start-finish line and cut a tire, especially at this juncture. So the field is under caution. The safety car has pulled out directly in front of the field in turn one. Tim Richmond stays out, as does Bodine and Earnhardt. Now it will be a game of monkey see, monkey do. Should one of the front runners elect to come onto pit road, then you'll have to make a decision in consultation with the crew chief and the driver as to whether you follow suit to come in or do like Tim Richmond did and elect to stay out. Now they pulled the metal off the racetrack. There you can see one of the NASCAR officials carrying it back over the wall. Just some sheet metal. Nothing too major, but you wouldn't want to run over it. We've got 191 laps completed, Bob, and this thing is official. And as we said, under green flag conditions, it looks like it could go just at any moment right down to the checkered flag, the way these guys are racing. Unfortunately, Mother Nature was just not cooperative with us here today, and it caused us to uh, have about a two hour and 15 minute downtime and we're going to have to break away now for coverage of the golf tournament in Memphis in just a few moments but please be assured that we will be back to update you on what's going on here in Darlington and certainly we'll have the uh, finish of the race just as soon as 
that occurs, and it could occur uh, quite soon because, as we have mentioned, the dark clouds are gathering in, and uh, if we are going to continue the bad weather that we have had all weekend, it could rain at any moment. We're sorry, but uh, the rain has just uh, really caused this uh, problem that we are going to experience here this afternoon. There's the top five, Tim Richmond, Jeff Bodine, Bernhardt, Neil Bonnet, and Ricky Rudd with 192 of 367 laps completed. And there are the second five, Bill Elliott, Darrell Waltrip, Cale Yarborough, Buddy Baker, and Bobby Allison. Right now, we're going to uh, switch you to Memphis, Tennessee for the golf tournament that's going on right there. But we will be back with updates here at Darlington. Coverage of the golf tournament. Tim Richmond is still leading. Jeff Bodine is second and Dale Earnhardt third. As you can see, 197 of 367 laps completed. We are under caution because of a very minor spin down in turn number three by Rick Wilson. And there is also some rain falling. But at the moment, Richmond still leads. Tim Richmond, Buddy Baker, and Ricky Rudd running in the top three positions. We are under caution again because of an accident up in turn number two involving H.B. Bailey. Not a serious accident by any stretch of the imagination. H.B. just got the car a little too high on the racetrack and bumped the outside wall. Yes, he did, but everything's okay for H.B. Bailey. He continued under his own way, but Tim Richmond and Buddy Baker, they did not pit during this caution period, and they've managed to work their way to the front of the pack, and we're right back into a hot Southern 500, Bob. It's Morgan Shepard running in fourth position right now. Daryl Waltrip is fifth. In sixth position is Bobby Hillen Jr. In seventh is Jeff Bodine. Eighth is Dale Earnhardt. Ninth is Bill Elliott. And tenth is the number 12 car of Neil Bonnet. That is the way they're running with 223 laps complete. Southern 500. He has really closed in on the leader, Tim Richmond. He was within just a few car lengths of him. Now there is Morgan Shepard, followed by Dale Earnhardt, third and fourth. Fifth is Jeff Bodine, and sixth is Daryl Waldrop. Tim Richmond continues to lead, but Baker is definitely closing with 239 laps complete. And the lead has changed. Dale Earnhardt has come like a shot from a cannon around Tim Richmond. And Earnhardt now leads this race. By the way, that was the first time that he had led today, just two laps ago, when he took the lead. It is Buddy Baker running in third position, and Jeff Bodine is fourth. But Earnhardt is the leader at the moment. In South Carolina, 271 laps have been completed. We are yellow because of debris on the back stretch. Pit stops are being made. All of the leaders came in for a stop. It's going to be Dale Earnhardt reassuming command of this race with Tim Richmond running second and Jeff Bodine running in third position. There you can see 271 of 367 laps have been completed. Earnhardt comes in again. Back to Minnesota. 83 out of 367 completed. It is Dale Earnhardt leading the race. Tim Richmond, rather, uh, Jeff Bodine leading the race. It is Tim Richmond running second. Third is Daryl Waldrop. Fourth is Ricky Rudd. And fifth is Bill Elliott. And there is the uh, second and third place. But Jeff Bodine at the moment covering the Southern 500 at Darlington International Raceway for you. Jeff Bodine is the leader, but the man on the move is Dale Earnhardt. He is involved in a terrific battle right now for second position with Tim Richmond. Everybody's going to have to make one more pit stop, and strategy in the pit could determine the outcome. He wants to get back out on that lead lap. He's going to challenge Bodine. No, not enough. He's still one lap down. Southern 500 at Darlington International Raceway, and we have a car that has apparently come in contact with the wall, and the yellow flag is out. Here. Can Dale Earnhardt get his lap back? He's going to make a bid here. As they come through turns three and four, they are racing to the yellow flag. Here is Earnhardt going to the low side, but Bodine is trying to block him. Now Earnhardt has to go high on the racetrack, slowing his progress. Let's see if he does. They cross the stripe. No! Jeff Bodine holds off that challenge by Dale Earnhardt. That was not for the lead. 
remember, but it was the bid by Dale Earnhardt to get his lap back. He had to pit a few laps ago because of a bad tire on the front part of the car, and that put him a lap down. He simply could not make up the lap. The reason that we are yellow is because of a uh, incident involving Phil Parsons. He has made contact with the wall once again, moves by the main straightaway here with some body damage showing. That's the reason for the yellow. We also have had rain here at the Darlington in the last few minutes, and we welcome you to this update from our golf match. Boy, what a heads-up move by Jeff Bodine. He knew that he wanted to keep Dale Earnhardt one lap down, and he covered the spot sufficiently, more than sufficiently, as they hurtled towards the start-finish line, knowing that the caution was out. Nothing that was out of the ordinary is what you do. When the leader is leading, it's his racetrack, and he can cover it. He did it nicely and with a lot of class, and I'm sure Dale Earnhardt would agree. So Jeff Bodine is the leader here at the Southern 500. Tim Richmond second, Bill Elliott third, Ricky Rudd fourth, Dale Earnhardt fifth, Buddy Baker is sixth, Morgan Shepard seventh, eighth is Bobby Allison, and ninth is Bobby Dillon Jr. Those cars on the lead lap and in 10th position and lap down is Dale Earnhardt. Now here is Buddy Baker running sixth in for a pit stop. And he pulls back out onto the racetrack. 331 laps have been completed. Our big question at the moment, is it raining too hard to resume this? Thank you. 
becomes the eighth driver to win this race from the pole position. Let's go down to Jerry Punch, who's with Harry Hyde, the crew chief. Well, jubilation here in the Richmond pits, and Harry, it's going to be a great victory. Congratulations for you. Oh, the Southern 500 is a great victory, ain't it? To anybody, and, and we're real proud, and, and Tim is just a true champion. He drove like a champion all day, and we're so happy for Hendricks Motorsports and Rick Hendricks and Folgers Coffee. I tell you what, this crew is never say die. They just keep on getting it, and Tim to, Tim just gets in there and keeps pitching, and I don't know. We're just lucky to be associated with these people. Well, I'll let you go on down to Victory Lane and congratulate your young driver. Congratulations again, Thank you Harry. very much. This is one I've always wanted to win, and uh, it's finally come true. I, I couldn't be happier. Congratulations, Harry, from the booth and to Tim Richmond, the driver of this car. And this is going to close the point standings. Tim Richmond going into this race was in third in the point standings, and he comes away with most points here this afternoon. He's maneuvering that Folger sponsored Chevrolet into victory lane. Moving in to the Southern 500 victory lane area is Tim Richmond. Well, this one was worth the wait, Bob. You can see how dark it is here in Darlington, but we are finally unbuckle and take off the helmet but you can see the grin on his face after having won this event here today and getting the congratulations of his mom through the car there they're solidly behind his efforts here you know this guy came from went from indycar racing after winning the rookie of the year in the indianapolis 500 and he has found a home here in winston cup competition about to step out of the car They say new teams aren't supposed to do it, but here you are with your fifth win, the Southern 500. Well, uh, yeah, it looked like Bill was going to get it there, and he went into one a little too hard and uh, hit the fence. Uh, and we just, you know, we we just held on. We tried to play as smart as we could. And I think uh, being, uh, you know, Harry kept telling me, take it easy. It's raining a little bit. Uh, don't mess it up. And uh, I was doing my best to catch... Elliot, but uh, had he not hit the wall, he'd have probably won, but... What happened? Why did he hit the wall? Could you tell, Tim? Well, it was real slippery in that part of the track anyway. Earnhardt and I kept going in there all day. Uh, I never hit the back end of the car, but I probably should have, and he just went in there a little too hot, and I saw it, and he, you know, punched the fence there, and it uh, ruined his chances. You were up and down in this race. There were times when you were led, and there were times when you were way in the back. What were your thoughts as the day went on? Were, were there disappointing moments, or did you always think that you were solid enough to have a shot at the end of the race? Well, no, there were some times uh, there that, you know, I wasn't sure uh, whether we were going to be able to pull it off or not. You know, Jeff was real strong, and, uh, you know, Earnhardt, he, you know, we knew he was going to be strong. We didn't see Daryl most of the day. Um, but, you know, Harry, uh, Harry won it. We had the fuel to go to the end. They, uh, they didn't pit there then. I don't think the five car did, and a few other ones, and... And it paid off, um, you know, strategy hey, wins the race. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Hyde, his crew chief, has just hugged Tim Richmond. This is one very happy duo, for sure. <laughs> Timmy, did, when, when he held you out at, the, at the, the point where a lot of guys came in, did you begin to doubt Harry at all? Did you think that was the right move? No, I didn't doubt him at all. I just, uh, I was a little upset. I told him the car was so darn tight I couldn't <laughs> drive it. And I asked him when we went back out, I said, did you take any wedge out of it? He said, no, we changed the stagger a little bit, and and I was just trying my butt off just as hard as I could, and I kept about miss, hitting that fence out there, and uh, I was getting a little upset, but not bad. I was more, I was intense after going after the nine car. I was trying to. Well, they picked up some points on the current point leader, Dale Earnhardt. Hi, Sandy and Ashland. I guess I had my sister in action, Sandy Welsh, and uh, the whales ribbon all them guys in Florida. <laughs> They picked up some points in this event for sure, and Bobby Allison had a fine finish as well, and he's with Jerry Punch. Well, a fine finish indeed for Bobby Allison, who's climbing out and getting some of the debris and dirt off of him that he's grinded in here for six and a half hours. Bobby, a super run for you. You almost had one. Well, we got close. We worked hard to get the car moved up to the front of the pack, and uh, 
you know, we kept working. Bobby Hudson and the crew kept working, uh, trying to get the chassis to stick. And uh, we, we, uh, they finally discovered something. Bobby finally discovered something late in the race that was helping. And uh, so we saved it for the last pit stop and pulled it off. And it really helped us. Uh, Tim got by us and, uh, you know, those other guys were ahead, but uh, there was a little bad luck went on out there and we weren't the recipients of it this time. How about uh, some of the wall tapping out there? I know you said you saw Jeff Bodine hit the wall. Yeah, the, Jeff just got out of shape off of four, you know. He just lost it and got in the wall and it uh, caused him to bust a tire. And uh, it was unfortunate for him because uh, he had to race one. He was far enough ahead of everybody that there really was no problem. Well, the five-time Southern 500 champion Bobby Allison gets a cold drink. He finishes second here today. And our winner's circle interview has been brought to you by Goodyear Eagles.